grow. So this will be absolutely fine, or this will mean all humans in the future are purple. We don't know. <laughs> we'll find out. Excellent. Yeah. Independent now. Uh, and it turns out that the internet is on its deathbed, Steve. I think I'm OK with that. <laughs> humans now share the web equally with bots, report warns amid fears of a dead internet, because it's just bots talking to each other. It's now 49.6% uh, of internet traffic's bots. Some of them are Lewis's biggest fans. <laughs> um, we'll get some, some messages from them later. Um, but this is going to get worse because of AI. This is basically going to be robots talking to robots on the internet. Fine, we won't notice. Uh, have a nice little chat. Uh, there's a widespread use use of bots already causing problems for X, formerly Twitter. Um, popular posts are now hit by loads of comments advertising pornography. And I must admit, after each time we do a show here, yeah. there is one channel that always says <laughs> lovely little pictures, cos it's just a little amuse-bouche between all the hate that we get from people yeah. who just have all the hate, and then yeah. you go, press to reveal, oh, all right, and then you crack on back to the hate. How is the internet dying, though? That's yeah, the bit I don't... Yeah, I didn't understand that myself. Steve? Well, it's because we're not going to be involved in it as much. The internet, a bigger chunk of the internet will be bots talking to bots. Fair no, enough. a bigger okay. chunk of our time will be used looking at bots. And it just means we're, we're just... We're going to look at it and... Good-looking look bots. Sexy now, bots. Yeah. Finally, we go to the Daily Star. It seems Mexican women spend far too much on pants and they need to go to Primark, Lewis. Yeah, God bless the Daily Star. We, don't, we haven't had our, like, uh, weather story. But this is this is a weather point. We did start story. the show with a weather story. I don't know if you remember. Oh yeah, we did, didn't we? Well, it's been so such a long time. Anyway, uh, Mexican drug cartels are stealing women's undie in military-style raids, and uh, this is the Daily Star, which is uh, which is ridiculous because it's not saying that 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 they're say that there's a there's a truckload of ladies' underwear and we're going to capture it. No, they, this is just. The, the Sinaloa and the Jalisco New Generation cartels in Mexico. They're, they're hijacking every truck, every truck, and some of those okay. trucks... Can I just say really quickly, drugs and women's underwear, a lot in common. You will ruin your 20s if you get into sniffing them. Yeah. The show is nearly over, so let's take another quick look at Thursday's front pages. The Daily Mail you. has Tories <laughs> trail Labour on defence, tax, migration, even Brexit. The Telegraph has Rayner faces new homes tax questions. The Guardian has Brexit blamed as UK drugs shortages put lives at risk. The Times has hopes of rate cuts suffer blow and iNews has Israel will defy plea for restraint and strike Iran, Cameron reveals. And finally, The Sun has American Idol Harry and those were your front pages. That's all we have time for, thanks to my guests. Lewis is back here tomorrow at 11pm with Kerry Marks and Leo Kirst. If you're staying, uh, if you're staying tuned for breakfast, do that. Good night. That warm feeling inside from Box Spoilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Time for your latest weather update from the Met Office here on GB News. Good evening. Temperatures dropping away tonight. It's going to be a cold start tomorrow. Much of the south will stay fine, but further north, some rain and cloud moving in, thanks to this little area of low pressure that's drifting south. Ahead of that, we've had a couple of weather fronts bringing some rain today, particularly for Northern Ireland. That's now spreading south across parts of Pembrokeshire, Devon and Cornwall, but clearing through this evening. Further showers across eastern England, they'll steadily fade as well. And where we've got the clear skies, southern Scotland, northwest England, Wales, a hint of blue on the chart, suggesting there will be a frost, certainly in the countryside. Most towns and cities just about staying above freezing, but certainly a, a chilly start to Thursday. For many, a bright, sunny start. There could be some showers early on across Kent. They should fade, but rain will creep into uh, the highlands of Scotland, the Western Isles first thing, and that'll spread across most of Scotland by lunchtime. Parts of the north and east of Northern Ireland seeing some rain and through the afternoon turning damp over Northern England and North Wales. But much of the south will stay dry and bright. We could reach 15 in London, a brighter day across East Anglia. Cooler further north with the winds picking up and those brisk winds, then a feature of the weather on Friday as well. Friday, broadly speaking, a mixture of sunshine and showers, a duller day across the southeast and a, a much wetter day across East Anglia compared to tomorrow. Feeling chilly again with that wind, much of Northern Ireland, Scotland having a drier day, uh, but still on the fresh side, 8 to 14 degrees. A brighter outlook with Box Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News.
Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Patrick Christie's. Every weeknight from nine, I bring you two hours of unmissable, explosive debate and headline-grabbing interviews. What impact has that had? We got death threats and the bomb threats on. Our job is to do what's in the best interests of our country. You made well, my I'm argument so... for me. My guests and I tackle the issues that really matter with a sharp take on every story. I'm hearing it up and down the country. That was a beginning, not an end. Patrick Christie's tonight from 9 p.m. only on GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com, keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister. And we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Good morning to you. Six o'clock, Thursday the 18th of April. Today, another scandal hits the Tory party as the MP Mark Menzies loses the whip over claims he misused campaign funds. Yes, as if Rishi Sunak didn't have enough to contend with. One of his MPs and a trade envoy, Mark Menzies, has now had the whip removed under very strange circumstances indeed. Find out more with me very soon. Travel carnage continues in Dubai as flash flooding, flash flooding devastates the city. We'll be speaking to an expat over there. Law enforcement bust an illegal website used by cyber criminals to defraud thousands of UK victims. 
70 asylum seekers are moved out of an ex-RAF base after major safety risks emerge. Prince Harry officially names the US as his primary residence in a move that signals the Duke is distancing himself further from the royals. With smoking set to be banned for those born after 2009 over health risks, is it time that the government get tougher on alcohol? And in the sport this morning, the Champions League is now Premier League less after Manchester City and Arsenal both go out. Emma Raducanu is on a roll. She's beaten the former world number one. And Ronnie O'Sullivan opens his snooker academy in Saudi Arabia. I wonder why that is. It's a beautiful start out there for many places and there's more sunshine to come this weekend. But before that happens, there is some rain to talk about in the forecast coming up shortly. Good morning to you. I'm Stephen Dixon. And I'm Ellie Costello and this is Breakfast on GB News. Um, now, I just wanted to uh, give a, a, a shout out to Take That oh. this morning. They're in trouble today and I think it's unfair. Why? Because they're doing con they're doing concerts and things again at the minute, and the yeah. son is is not happy. Yeah. Because someone in the crowd has noticed um, that they they have a teleprompter at the back, which is basically just hey. a massive screen with the lyrics on. A bit like what we have here. Well, yes, but we are, these scripts aren't. You know, we don't know them off by thirty heart. years old that yes. we've learnt off by heart. So, so they're being they're being nasty about take that, saying why will they? Why do they have to have a teleprompter? I mean, I found heaven. I mean, God, how long ago was that? I think I was at university when that came out. It's a very long time ago, <laughs> darling. Um, 30, 32 years ago. So they've got the words Let for them. Let me see. Let me get close to this. Oh, it really does it have really all does. of the lyrics there. Well, I think that's fair enough. And it's, but... it's definitely for them, not for the audience. Oh, it's for them, yeah. It's not facing the audience, it's facing the stage, oh. darling. But, you, need, you know, you need that. I think it's perfectly sensible. Well, yeah. They've obviously got a lot of content to remember, lots of lyrics to remember. So there you go. It's a fair play. So I think, you know, take that, you hang on in there, boys. Boys. Don't take it to heart. They're all older Although than me. I, ha I have seen um, a video of them. You might come for me now if I say this. What? I did think they were looking a bit. What? A bit like. Old man dancing on the stage. Yeah. yeah, I would agree. Okay. It was it was looking a little bit like cruise ship entertainers. I mean, to be um, you, uh, the idea that they were a boy band when in your fifties. Mm. I think is push is pushing it a little bit. Yeah, but nevertheless, they're still hugely successful. Hugely no, they popular. are. Yeah. Well, the same thing for Blue. Do you know the band Blue? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. So they are touring again, and they're just it's it's they're not really giving a lot on the stage. It oh. really is. That's as that's as far as they go. And it's a similar thing. I think I've seen videos on TikTok, and it's the younger generation seeing them for the first time. They're like, who are these old men dancing oh. to? Well, you know, the That's knees go, don't you? You get little bits of arthritis in your joints. Oh, yeah, like your little like me, finger. Like me, in my fingers. His little Killing finger me. is, is quite me. sore, isn't it? It's very sore. I think it's osteoarthritis, but I might be wrong enough self. Oh, you've diagnosed those. yourself, have you? <laughs> get on to the GP. Have, well, I, I, I've booked an appointment. Good. 2027, I'm in. <laughs> anyway. Less of that and more on this because uh, plenty of politics around today. There's going to be lots of politics every day in the run-up to this general election. Mm. Just you wait and see because people are desperate for it. It gets, it gets another um, lease of life, any old political story, when there's an election on. Mm. Anyway, unfortunately for the Conservative Party, it's bad news for them this time round uh, because one of their MPs, Mark Menzies, has lost the whip over the alleged misuse of campaign funds. Yes, Number 10 have launched an investigation into the matter. Menzies is now lo no longer a member of the Tory party and will sit as an independent MP in the House of Commons. Yeah, he's the MP for uh, filed. He's issued a statement saying, I strongly dispute the allegations put to me. I've complied with all the rules and declarations. There's an investigation ongoing, so I'm not commenting any further. But what are all these allegations, I wonder? Mm, well, let's put that to our political correspondent, Olivia Utley, who can tell us more. Good morning to you, Olivia. So another scandal to hit the Tory party in an election year. This is a headache for Rishi Sunak, isn't it? 
It is a massive headache for Rishi Sunak, and this has the whiff of quite a big scandal. Uh, Mark Menzies, who's the MP for Flyde and a uh, parliamentary uh, government trade envoy, has had the whip removed after allegations of fraud. What happened was uh, Mark Menzies was at home when at 3.15 in the morning he called his former uh, constituency local manager, a 78-year-old woman, and demanded that she transfer £3,000 of campaign money from his uh, campaign fund because he said he was being locked up by bad people and the only way he could get out was if he paid them this money. Uh, the woman refused... And in the morning, uh, Mark Menzies went to his current campaign manager, a woman called Shirley Green, and asked her to transfer the money. But by this point, the sum had been raised to £6,500. She did transfer the money and Mark Menzies uh, was then released. But it's not at all clear whether he paid back that money. And that isn't the only allegation. Over the last couple of years, Mark Menzies has demanded that money be transferred over to his own personal bank account to pay for uh, various medical procedures at one point demanding £35,000 be transferred. There was a time when there was no money left in the campaign fund coffers and party volunteers were paying their own personal savings. One woman cashed in her ISA uh, to, to, to help Mark Menzies out. Now it's not clear exactly what was going on but it sounds like blackmail. Mark Menzies has never confirmed his sexuality but it's rumoured that uh, he's gay and at one point he was accused of um, being uh, uh, paying a, a male rent boy. That was back in 2014, so this isn't the first scandal to hit this MP. And it's, it's thought that what happened was he went, he met a man on a dating app, went home with the man, got into some sort of difficulty, and then money was demanded from him. So it's a pretty big scandal. It's not going to go away any time soon. And it is the seventh Conservative MP that Rishi Sunak has lost in the last few years. OK. Olivia, for now, thanks very much indeed. Well, the Conservative Party have issued a statement saying uh, we're investigating allegations made regarding a member of Parliament. This process is rightfully confidential. The party takes all allegations seriously and will always investigate any matters put to them. Now, dozens of suspected cyber fraudsters have been arrested across the UK after authorities brought down an illegal website used by thousands of criminals to defraud victims worldwide. Well, police have identified at least 70,000 victims in the UK alone as sophisticated online enablers train criminals to set up fake websites to scam victims into handing over personal details. Mark White has the story for you this morning. Across the UK, dozens of suspected cyber criminals had a rude awakening as law enforcement here and around the globe moved in to smash a multi million pound online scam that's defrauded many thousands of victims. Multiple addresses were raided, and some suspects were pulled off flights at Manchester and Luton airports. You have been identified as uh, involved in. LabHost, an online phishing platform which allows users to set up fraudulent websites in order to impersonate online services such as banking. This is now the front page greeting any would-be cyber criminal trying to access the services of this illegal online site. The website LabHost is part of a hugely worrying development in cybercrime. It aimed to provide an easy step-by-step -step guide on how to download and use fake sites. Your page has installed and you're ready to spam. Make sure to check that it works before starting your spam. Stay safe and good spamming. Unsuspecting members of the public would then believe those sites were pages from legitimate businesses like banks and retailers all with the aim of phishing, of fooling victims into revealing personal details which would be used to commit fraud. There are, unfortunately, many enabling services to fraud. However, together with our law enforcement partners, we are um, tackling them. To take out an enabler means that we are able to um, take it out at source, and this, we hope, will send out a message to those using similar services that we can get their data and we will be onto them. 
Law enforcement have identified at least 70,000 victims of this latest cyber scam in the UK alone. The lab host site made more than a million pounds from 2,000 criminals who subscribed to download its services. Those attempting to access the site now are faced with a bit of online trolling from law enforcement. You've targeted victims all around the world. The police there may not be too happy with you. Think carefully about where you go on holiday next. That was your 2023 lab host wrapped. Lab host is dead now. With that illegal site now infiltrated and disrupted by authorities, dozens of those it was training and equipping in the art of cyber fraud are in police custody and likely facing prosecution. Mark White, GB News. Well, at 11 minutes past six, let's take a look at some other stories coming into the newsroom this morning. Well, the government's flagship illegal migration policy, the Rwanda bill, had another major setback, suffering a fourth defeat in the House of Lords. Peers maintaining pressure on the government over the deportation plan, with continual demands for reassurances in the form of amendments. The House of Lords ignored ministerial calls to back down and insisted on further revisions to the safety of Rwanda bill. Prince William is to return to official public duties today for the first time since the Princess of Wales revealed her cancer diagnosis. He is set to visit a surplus food distribution charity, Surplus to Supper, following, followed by a youth centre in West London, which benefits from the organisation's deliveries. Samantha Davis, founder of the dwarfism charity Little People UK. She's the wife of the actor Warwick Davis. She's died at the age of 53. In a statement, Mr Davis paid tribute to his favourite human. The couple met on the set of the film Willow in 1988 and married three years later. Now, there's been chaos in the UAE as thousands of UK travellers are struggling to get home after Dubai International Airport was closed due to flash flooding. Well, yes, some pretty serious flooding yeah. as well. Uh, passengers told to stay away unless absolutely necessary after it was hit with more than a year's rainfall in just 24 hours. Well, one man has tragically lost his life as a result of the torrential weather. Let's talk to British expat Kerish Bryant, who's there for us this morning. Great to see you, Kerish. Uh, what's the situation? What's been going on? Oh, my goodness. It has been chaos indeed. We've seen so much happening in 24 hours. I think we're still in shock. The roads have been flooded. Cars are still stranded in the streets. Um, you can see the aftermath of blown down um, signs and boards all over the city. Unfortunately, um, some people ha are still stuck in their properties. Some people's homes have been flooded. It really has been a, a very scary time for us all here. Karish, how have you been affected? Has your apartment been flooded? Have you been able to get out and about? Oh, goodness me. In the words of batting down the hatches, we was closing the windows and doors with all of our force, barricading ourselves in with towels. Um, it's safe to say some of the older apartments in Dubai have not been built for this weather. So we uh, have a very big laundry bill uh, coming our way for the towels and blankets used to stop the rain from coming in. I mean, presumably somewhere like Dubai just isn't built for this, hasn't got the, I don't know, even the sort of drainage to deal with this level of rainfall in such a short amount of time. Correct. I mean, we are in the middle of the desert um, and the sewage systems have been thought about. It's something that a lot of people have researched, um, but you must remember, if it's not going to be filled with water, it will be filled with sand. So we have to have a compromise. We was never expecting this type of rainfall. It's been over 75 years since we've had such rainfall in the UAE. And 75 years ago, what you see now was just a vision, just a dream. And what have the authorities been telling you there? I mean, we're, we're hearing about the airport there uh, and the disruption to people trying to get out. But what, what advice are you being given? The advice we've been given from our local authorities um, has been to stay safe and stay indoors for as, as long as possible, to stock up on all utensils and food, just to make sure you are safe if you are trapped anywhere, um, and also just to kind of look out for one another as well. 
OK. Uh, look, uh, Kerish, really good to see you this morning. Let's hope things improve uh, pretty quickly. Thanks very much indeed. Heck! Have you seen the videos? Oh, it's terrible. In, I mean, honestly. Awful. And I mean, you see that little... If you're watching on the TV, that there's one of the videos, there's a little cat... I thought that would affect you. ...hanging on it to... It looked like a little Timmy. ...hanging on to a car door handle. Aww. It's right up... The water's right up there. Thank heaven someone is there to pick him up or her up. It looks like a little Timmy, doesn't it? Bless it. I mean, it is such, such a worry for people living there, because, as you say, the infrastructure just isn't designed for that level of rainfall. No. And there's so many people, expats, living out in Dubai, like Kerish. And I, I was starting to see the videos on social media, must have been a few days ago now. Mm. And it, I was like, oh, please, it's just a storm. But it has, obviously, as we can see from the pictures on the screen, become really quite serious in the past couple of days. It's flooding across Dubai. Can't and imagine. it's affected a lot of people's homes. You can't even get around. A lot of people have lost their cars in the water. Mm. Awful. <sighs> Yes, pretty grim. Thankfully, whatever we want about the weather over here, it's not as bad as that at the moment, at least. Let's get the forecast with Aidan McGiven. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello, good morning. Welcome to the latest forecast from the Met Office for GB News. A chilly start in many places today, cloudier in the north with some outbreaks of rain moving in this morning, especially for northern and western Scotland, but a few light outbreaks of rain reaching Northern Ireland later in the morning. And then this area pushes into northern England and eventually north Wales by the middle of the afternoon. Turning cloudier in many places then, but staying sunny in the East Midlands, East Anglia, Southern England as well, where it will feel pleasantly warm. 15, perhaps 16 Celsius. Not feeling pleasantly warm in the northwest with the wind and the rain. And that rain tends to topple its way southwards during the evening, but it also tends to fizzle away. So not a great deal of rain reaching the south or parts of Wales even. And it will be followed by showers, blustery showers, as the wind picks up overnight. With the breeze overnight, temperatures will stay up in the mid to high single figures, so generally frost free. But it's going to be a blustery start to Friday. Areas of cloud moving south, some light showers for many places. The most frequent showers will be affecting the far north of Scotland. The wind will be feeling cold with that wind strongest along the North Sea coast. And there'll be some big waves along the North Sea coast as well. Showers by the afternoon confined to the east of England. Elsewhere, brighter spells emerging. Some sunshine and highs of 14 or 15 degrees. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Now, there's still time to grab your chance to win a Greek cruise travel goodies and a £10,000 tax-free cash bank balance boost. Yes, very good. And what? Tax-free ta tax cash bank, bank balance, balance boost. boost. Oh, it's easy for us to say at this time of day. It's only 19 minutes past six. Anyway, it's a whole lot of money, 20 grand in total. Here are the details. <laughs> Don't miss your chance to win our biggest prize so far. There's an incredible £10,000 in tax-free cash to spend however you like. Plus, courtesy of Variety Cruises, a bespoke seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, your next holiday could be on us. Choose any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. We'll also send you packing with these luxury travel Gifts. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text WIN to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04, PO Box 8690, Derby DE19T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5 pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. And on that note, oh. the Daily Mail oh, have got yes. something very important today. It's where you can go for a cheap summer getaway, because obviously that cruise, that giveaway, is for next summer. Yes. And this is for this summer. All right, well, that isn't cheap. It's 10 grand. No, that is real luxury. So if we need to be a bit more budget this summer, I've got the answers yeah, for you. Yeah, if you don't win that, then... We've got, we've got a good trick up our sleeves with this one. This is the top 10 European bargains right. for summer 2024. And Greece 
is the answer. Coming in at number one is the island of... Kalimnos. Yes. Uh, now, Still 847 quid. Is, I mean, it's not cheap, that is correct, but it is... That per person? Uh, that is based on a seven-night package, average price per person, yes. But you do need to fly into Cos and then get a 40-minute ferry. It's not quite easy, is it? Uh, but Thassos comes in next and then Levkada. So all Levkada, Greek islands, yeah. this is the way to do it. Oh, yeah. And then Spain, Costa Brava. Yes. Comes in at number four. I was quite surprised number six is Amalfi Coast. Oh, that's meant to be. I think that would be very expensive. You'd think so. It's meant to be lovely, isn't it? It's that, um, and that's all Capri and all those sort yeah, of places. Yeah, yeah. I'm it? going to a wedding there. Oh, July, are you? And it wasn't cheap, let me tell you that. Venetian Riviera. I wouldn't have thought that was cheap either. Nine hundred. It's still, it's still a thousand pounds per person. Yeah. That's cheap. Yeah, See, for, a week, for a week away though, that's not too bad. It's, it's a lot no. of money. Yeah. You've got a family, you've had it. Yeah, no, that's true. If there's a few of you, it is very, very expensive. Uh, but mm. this is from Witch, uh, and they're saying travelling in the summer holidays is notori to notoriously expensive, but this is. This shows that if you're flexible on a destination, you can save hundreds of pounds. Apparently, there's the 10 cheapest places in Europe. Right. And Greece is your answer. Oh, there you go. Well, there you go. There you go. If you're planning, then we don't think we're going to get a summer holiday. No, I don't think we we're are gonna either. Be busy oh, I don't think we can go away on holiday this year, because there could be an election call at any time. We've had it. Um, anyway, maybe we should move abroad permanently. That'd be nice, wouldn't it? Because uh, that's what Prince Harry has done officially now, cutting ties with the UK. We'll give you all the details in just a moment. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com, keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. I'm Patrick Christie's. Every weeknight from nine, I bring you two hours of unmissable, explosive debate and headline-grabbing interviews. What impact has that had? We got death threats and the bomb threats on. Our job is to do what's in the best interest of our country. You made my argument for me. My guests and I tackle the issues that really matter with a sharp take on every story. I'm hearing it up and down the country. That was a beginning, not an end. Patrick Christie's tonight from 9 p.m. only on GB News, Britain's news channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Six twenty-four. Good morning. It's emerged Prince Harry has now declared the United States as his new country of residence in official documents. I'm not sort of. I mean, well, yeah, he's, no, he's I lived there for years. I wasn't shocked by this. No. But no, uh, critics have warned that the move signals the Duke is distancing himself further from his family. Well, he's lived in California with his wife since 2020. So, I don't think... I mean, if he'd, if he'd put his country of residence was the UK, I'd have been a bit miffed. <laughs> anyway. We're joined now by foreign correspondent Sarah Firth. Good to see you this morning, Sarah. Um, so, what do you make of this? Is it much of a story? Prince Harry's lived in the USA since 2020, four years. I mean, it's right, isn't it, that he should declare the United States as his country of residence? 
Yes, good morning to you both. You're absolutely right. It's not new information because, of course, in 2020, when the Duke and Duchess of Sussex stepped back from their royal duties, Prince Harry left the UK and he came and eventually made a new home in uh, Meghan Markle's home state of California. So the Duke and Duchess of Sussex have been living there uh, where they are now with their young family. But this is the first sort of official documents that have been seen uh, in filings for one of uh, the Duke of uh, Sussex's companies. It's a sustainable tourism initiative that he has a 75% stake in called uh, Travel Lift. And these are document documents that were filed uh, with Companies House back in the UK. And so it's the first time that it's been seen um, as the change officially on those documents. You've got uh, where it says new country of residence, states usually resident. He's got the USA now instead of the UK. Now, the Duke of Sussex have actually listed his uh, date of residence in the USA as June 2023. But as we said, he has been here a little bit longer. So it's it's not new information, but uh, it's these formal documents that have been filed with the UK's company's house for his business. Uh, clearly, the Duke of Sussex, you know, making it known that he feels comfortable here in the USA in his new home. I mean, so as you say, this is now on formal documents. It does feel somewhat official, even though, as you say, it's not new information. Critics are saying that it, it creates more of a distance between him and his family. How true do you think that is? But it's a difficult one because the relationship has been very fraught. And, of course, back home right now, you've got his family dealing with a number of very difficult health situations, both with King Charles uh, and with uh, Princess Catherine. So it's a difficult moment, for sure, for the royal family. Uh, you've had, as we said, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex stepping back and, and really being away from the UK for a large amount of that time since 2020 when they stepped back as working royals. Now, a lot of royal watches, and there's been a lot of commentary as well around, potentially this is the date that he'd um, listed on Companies House documents for this uh, business of his. He had put, uh, as we said, June 2023 as the date, and a lot of people have said that actually coincides with the date that the couple vacated their Frogmore Cottage residence, which, of course, they were asked by King Charles when he became king to, uh, to vacate. Um, they'd been there for three years since their marriage. So a lot of people pointing perhaps to that being behind the reason that they don't have that UK residence anymore. They've been quite vocal as well in the past about, you know, feeling that that was their safe space in the UK. Um, so potentially that's maybe behind uh, this more official uh, documentation actually stating that um, it is the USA that, that the Duke of Sussex now considers home. <laughs> OK, Sarah Firth, good to see you this morning. Thank you very much indeed. Very good, her. Uh. She's very good, isn't she? She's very good. She's managed to talk three minutes or four minutes about... Not a lot. That's a professional for you. I tell you, he's also very good about talking for minutes with nothing much to say. It's full point. <laughs> you know what? I'll take that because what I was yeah. expecting was from one professional to one who's a complete amateur. With no, 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 no. Okay. That's what I was expecting. As if I did. You miss me while I was away? So it was. You missed me, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Um, let's have a look at. Oh, Hanley, see you gloating. Was he on the bobsleigh? By the way, there wasn't him on the bobsleigh, was it? Uh, was he bobsleighing? I think he probably was because then, so? then the yeah. Because I think they they have. Oh, the big, bo uh, I think, uh, and it's actually not really him. Oh, my yeah, yeah. He was probably um, America at the time. Yes. You've been you smug this morning, mainly because of no, Arsenal. No, I'm not. Because of Arsenal. Well, no, you I'm are. Not. <laughs> you were dancing around the newsroom I first I thing. I was not. Honestly, I was not. <laughs> Manchester City first. We'll start oh, with Manchester God. City. This is this unbelievable. Do it without smiling. OK, I can all warm myself up. Right. Look, it's, it's, been very, it's difficult because the Champions League, we want English teams to do well in the Champions League. More or less. But quarter, this is the quarter-final of the Champions League. Manchester City play Real Madrid. It was 3-all after the first leg. And now we go into the second leg, which was at the Etihad. you think the hard work had been done in Madrid. But Madrid went ahead after 12 minutes. And then City attacked and attacked and attacked. But couldn't get a goal. Kevin De Bruyne scores after 76 minutes. So we're thinking maybe it's going to be OK. But um, went to extra time, then went to penalties. 120 attacks for Manchester City compared to Real Madrid's 19. Man City had 18 corners. 
to Real Madrid's one. So it gives you an example of what the game was like. Uh, and then when it came to penalties, um, Julian Alvarez sc scored the first one for Man City. Luka Modric, who's now 76 years old, still playing for Real Madrid. Um, he missed, and then we're thinking, OK, it's looking good. But then two misses. Bernardo Silva hits a terrible penalty. See, it's all... It, the thing about penalties mm. is, you know, you get, oh, it's a lottery. It's not yeah. a lottery because no, not. there's a lot in there. That's the, how you deal with the situation. And you've got to go up and you've got to think about where you're going to hit the penalty. Don't change your mind. Well, get in the net, back of the net. That's, that's kind of like the mo main thing of mm -hmm. it. But Manchester City didn't do that then with, um, with Bernardo Silva and Matteo Kovacic. They went forward and then it was all over. So Real Madrid have gone through, oh, which I is guess. unfortunate. Uh, Arsenal. Yes. Go on. Arsenal were knocked out by... Bayern Munich yesterday. Right. Harry Kane playing for Bayern Munich had a quiet game. Oh, oh quiet well, you see that. Oh, you quiet no, 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 quiet game <laughs> uh, for for Harry and and Arsenal. It was it, that was cagey. It was a really difficult game. They looked very tired at the end, but Bayern Munich came through after the draw at uh, at the Emirates. So now Bayern Munich are through. They will play Real Madrid in the semi-final, right. and then we've got the other one as well, which is Dortmund versus Paris Saint Germain. Mm. Yeah. How did I do? Yeah, okay. you did very well on that, actually. You were less smiley about fans. Arsenal. I'm not, not happy about Arsenal going out. <laughs> Delighted. Very good. It's thrilled. Yeah. Um, should we talk about my favourite team, which is Bayer Leverkusen? Yes, I know you're a big fan Ooh, of Bayer Leverkusen. I am. I am a big Why? fan of the German what? Bundesliga. That's correct. I know... <laughs> well, the thing is... I always know that you're a Bundesliga specialist, and uh -huh. that's why you always take us back to the Bundesliga. But Bayer Leverkusen, see, this, you're going to be torn because Bayer Leverkusen are playing West Ham tonight. Uh. So West Ham are 2 0 down. Bayer Leverkusen, who won the Bundesliga only at the weekend, and, 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 and uh, usually it was Bayern Munich, but they won it for 11 years on the trot. Bayer Leverkusen have won it completely out of the blue. So they are playing West Ham. They haven't won, haven't lost all season, but it's at the London Stadium, so we wish West Ham well, which is in the Europa League. Um, and also Liverpool, who are 4 0 down against Atalanta. So who would have thought last mm. week at Anfield? So now they've got to go to Italy and try and turn that around in the Europa League. Do, and you, think also, they, do you think they can? Well, it's a big it, ask. It is a huge ask, but you never know. You never know. But the thing is, it's all about the coefficient, as, mm. as you well know there, Ellie. Mm. I it's do It's the well. coefficient, which means that a German team or an English team, this fifth place in the Premier League, could get into the Champions League next year, which is like either Aston Villa or Spurs. Are you following me so far? No is the answer. But the coefficient, it just basically means which country, either Germany or England, do better in Europe, and whoever does better by the time we get to the finals will then get an extra place in the Champions League for next year. Oh, I see, Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> no idea what you're talking about. Um, you know what? I know what I'm talking about. It. That's and all then that I matters. lost myself halfway through it. <laughs> Emma Raducanu. Yeah, Emma Raducanu. I mean, do you know She's what? on I'm, the up. I'm she really is... pleased for her. I'm pleased for her as well. Because, you know, it's all very easy to not rat Emma Raducanu. She won the US Open when she was, you know, when she was like 18. 12. Yeah, yeah. And, and she was so young. And then so many injuries and everybody was thinking, oh, it's just a flash in the pan. But then she did really well in the Billie Jean King Cup, and then she beat Angelique Kerber, a former world number one, three-time major winner. So she beat her 6-1, 6-2, third winner in a week, although, slight caveat, Angelique Kerber, she was out for 18 months, she's had a baby, and she hasn't... She only just come back to professional tennis in December. But even so, she's still a great tennis player. Oh, yeah. So I think things are looking good at, and much better for... Emma Raducanu, so we're really hopeful for and her. And it's a she, I mean, she's picking up a bit of momentum, isn't she? I mean, that's got to be good for the spirit. Yeah. <laughs> I think so. That's yeah, I mean, so momentum is three. It is three, yeah, so the momentum. I see what you're doing. You're just going down that sport momentum line, aren't you? That's what you're doing. Yeah, I just... I, yeah, I wanna, it's all about momentum. I want to see her do well. I want to see her do well. Yeah, me well. too. I Absolutely. feel like people have been quite harsh towards her. I think so too. I think so. It's it's like, oh, well, she's just a flushy... There's no, you know, too, spent too much time modelling. I mean, you're going to get... Obviously, yeah. when we you're successful, all you're going to get all these deals. Of course, we all have that, but we just have to, you know, yeah. come part. I don't think you win the US Open on a fluke, do you? But anyway, that's just me. I'm not a tennis expert. Um, you're, a, you're a Bundesliga expert. I know. That's what you're I can't right. be everything. Yeah. Um, <laughs> do we have time to talk about Ronnie O'Sullivan? We do. We yeah, do. yeah, Ronnie O'Sullivan. See what you're making this. World Snooker Championship comes back at the weekend. Now, Ronnie has signed a deal with Saudi Arabia. It's a three-year deal. There's Ronnie there looking... 
Thrilled. Isn't he? <laughs> yes, there he is. Oh, yeah, so what, what am I going to do? Am I going to put the black or am I going to put the pink? That's the look on his eye. But anyway, three-year deal in Saudi Arabia. Now, this is interesting because there's going to be a Ronnie O'Sullivan Academy in Riyadh. Mm. Right. Which is interesting, it's isn't packed. it? It'll be packed. Why? Well, yes, I'm sure it will be. He's... he's and what... I, the, the, this is the quote. He says, I've given everything to snooker and I'm grateful to be able to give something back. Isn't that lovely of him? To grow the sport in new markets. It's all in his heart. He's gone to Saudi Arabia, of all places. Do we know how much dough there is involved in I, this? I, I would have thought he'd be doing it for free, wouldn't he? Oh. Wasn't he doing it for the goodness out of his heart? He's giving back. He's giving back to the young snooker players of Riyadh mm. to try and get them. But it's, it's all about growing the sport. But Saudi Arabia, of all places... Yeah. Yeah, well, I don't... Big money. I, I mean, I don't blame him. Everyone else is. You know, it, it seems that all the sports washing all seems to have gone out the window. It was only a couple of years ago that we had Rafa Nadal or, or, or Roger Federer saying, I'm not going to play tennis in Saudi Arabia. Now, live golf, tennis, football, everything. And now snooker. So now snooker as well. Snooker, what yeah. next? Yeah. He wants a slice of the pie, doesn't For he? For those of us who don't have a load of money... Yes. Uh, Richard Wilde has been in touch about holidays and cheap holidays because we're so the cheapest one in the papers, according to which... Was like best part of 900 quid yeah. per person for mm -hmm. a week. Richard Wilde has been mm. in touch and says you can go to Malta for £60 per person per night, half board. Well, how are you going to get there? Is that, that including I don't no, know. I think you need a flight on top, but that's not bad, is it? Oh, 60 quid. Yeah. What's the well, place thanks, like? Richard, for that. I don't know. Richard likes it. OK, well, if Richard's happy. Richard, yeah, let I'm us happy. know how much the flights are looking like, yeah. please. Mm. You can be our travel agent this morning. But I'm going to Malta, actually, on a hen. I'd use a plane if I were you. <laughs> 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 I've honest. never been. I'm quite excited. Also, Malta is on is number ten on the list of the top ten European it's bargains. Be, when is it you going exactly? June. Just for everybody to avoid Malta at a certain point. <laughs> oh, okay. the head party. I know it's going to be. Isn't it? Wow. Can I imagine? She yes. ended up getting deported. <laughs> what from Malta? I can see, I can see it coming. Yeah. Now. You know they got a George Cross, don't you? It's Malta GC because it's the only place that's actually got a George Cross from the really? wall. So it's yeah, Malta did... GC. Yeah. I did not know that. There you go. Oh, I didn't know that. Thank you, Paul. Quaid. But it's an absolute pleasure. That's what I'm here for. Yeah. He's full of the fun facts, isn't he? Here's one for you, Paul. How much would you be willing to pay for a cup of coffee? Um, probably I've paid too much. I'll probably go up to about four quid. Really? Oh, no. You'd have a heart attack. Anyway, the world's most expensive coffee has landed in Britain, apparently. We'll tell you all more in the papers in a couple of minutes. <laughs>Good morning, I'm Russell Holding on the M56 in Cheshire. The inside lanes closed eastbound between junctions 14 and 12 from Chester to Runcorn. It's for emergency resurfacing the damage caused when a lorry caught fire last night in Staffordshire on the A462. There's a report of a problem at Snares Hill in Wolverhampton just off junction 11 of the M6. On the M6 in Warwickshire, there are southbound queues towards junction 2 for the M69 near Coventry because of roadworks. On the A48M in Cardiff, there's a lane closed southbound for emergency barrier repairs after an accident earlier at St Melons. In London, Kentish Town Road is closed northbound at Camden Town for an investigation. Trains aren't running between Basingstoke and Salisbury with some Diverting via Southampton because of a gas leak in the railway. The delays of up to an hour to the FDS sailing between Dover and Dunkirk. And that's the latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website, gbnews.com. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria De Piero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel.
Oh, here we go. Oh, here we go. Uh, it's 20 to 7. Let's have a look at some of the newspapers for you. The Tories trail Labour on defence tax, migration and Brexit, according to a new poll in the Mail today. The Guardian says Brexit is to blame for a UK drug shortage that's putting lives at risk. In the Telegraph, uh, a dozen police officers investigating uh, the Labour deputy leader's financial affairs after she sold her house for a large profit and didn't pay any um, capital gains tax because she says she was living there. Uh, she denies all the allegations, but anyway, that story rumbles on. Mm, it certainly does. In the Express this morning, the Lords have defied the will of the people again, they say, as they send the Rwanda asylum bill back to the House of Commons. And you better watch out because uh, big cats do walk among us, according to the Star, but it's OK because if you gently chat to a wild puma, uh, it'll be all right. Yes, don't run. Stroke it under the chin. Yeah, don't run is what I read this morning, which is very good. Yeah, you have to just treat it like Timmy. Yeah. Just chat to it like Timmy. Ooh. Exactly. OK, well, joining us now is psychotherapist Lucy Beresford <laughs> and political commentator Andy Williams. Good to see you both this morning. And, Andy, let's start with the front page of the Mail, shall we, with the Tories trailing Labour on defence, tax, migration, Brexit and even the NHS. On everything. Yeah, mm. there's a new poll that shows that on every single vital issue, as they put it, mm. um, Labour lead the Conservatives. Only 8% of people are satisfied with the government, even on traditionally strong Tory areas like defence, uh, like Brexit, uh, like managing government debt, Labour lead. Labour leads 35%, uh, 35% ahead on the NHS. They are ahead on every single thing, so it makes pretty grim reading. But it's like Tories. on defence. Yeah. Um, I mean, it is, it is disturbing for the Tories on their mm. what, traditional Tory topics. 15% trust the Tories, 22% trust Labour, 42% say I wouldn't trust either. Mm. So it's hardly a you know, ringing endorsement. I, I think that's right, it's not a ringing endorsement. And the other thing mm. I would say to caveat this poll is that it is conducted by Lord Ashcroft. He does have mm. a habit of trying to undermine Rishi Sunak. I think, let's be honest, that's the purpose of this poll. But to not be leading on any area whatsoever, even on those traditional... And also, this areas. isn't an outlier poll. That You know, most of the polling for the last two years, I don't think the Tories have been ahead on any published no. poll for over two years. Mm. And the problem with this is that it sets the narrative. Mm. You have a sense, which is that actually the Conservatives can't do anything right. And the only, the only psychological issue is if a number of voters think, oh, well, actually, it's not worth me voting then, because mm. it's obviously going to be a Labour landslide, and therefore I don't have to vote. So that, that's the only thing that Labour might have to consider. If all of these polls are saying the same thing, mm. what's the impact going to be on actual polling day? Yeah. Mm. Interesting. British values. Now, what, I mean, how do you define British values? <laughs> uh, whose values and general outlook on life do you think are closer to those of the British public as a whole? Conservatives, 13%. Mm. Labour Party, 31%. Mm. 42% say neither or neither. Um, but that's, that's interesting. There was a great poll the other day, and I'll, maybe I'll find it for the next hour, where they looked at um, who would you trust most to do things like put up a shelf or who oh. would you most like to go to the pub with or who would you trust to cook the best roast dinner out of Rishi Sunak and, and Keir Starmer. And Keir Starmer led in all of those as well. So there we are. That's the... That's the real quiz, as they say in the office. Food I wouldn't trust either of them to put up a shelf. <laughs> Would you not? To be perfect. No, no. Neither of them look particularly like good shelf putter-uppers. Is that what we need, I leading I the country? Well, That's exactly. What it's it doesn't matter. Mm. Yeah, I think, I, th I think you're right. I think you're right. But in I that, can't in judge that same poll, Rishi DIY. Sunak um, came out on top for helping you save money, that he would know where to go to get a bargain or something like that. Right, so... yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Um, Lucy, The Guardian this morning, um, looking at Brexit. Brexit's getting a bit of a hammering in a lot of the papers, actually, today. Yeah. But this is about drug shortages in the UK. Mm. I think there's been a bit of a mix-up at The Guardian uh, between causation and correlation, that actually what they're saying is that there is truly uh, a deficit in the number of drugs that we can get hold of, particularly for things like ADHD, mm. some epilepsy drugs. Speak to any woman over the age of 50 who's been struggling to get HRT, 
that has been a problem. But it has also been a problem in other European countries as well. And as The Guardian points out in their article, the ADHD shortage has been only since last year, and we actually left the EU in 2020. So the idea that this is all down to Brexit isn't accurate. Right. Mm. But it does beg the question, what do we do about it? Mm -hmm. Because you say the ADHD one is... is hugely problematic, actually, for a lot of people yeah. who were suddenly finding that you're not even meant to just immediately come off some of these drugs and that their suppliers just stop. Or, or uh, a lot of GPs are not prescribing them because they know that they're not available. And that, again, that, that has been the case for about 12 months. Paul Rees, the chief executive of the National Pharmacy Association, said that more worryingly is this idea that actually shortages of medicine is what we're getting used to. It's the no new mm. normal. But I would stress that actually isn't just a UK wide problem, it's actually across Europe as well. And that's to do with all sorts of things like supply chains from China, supply chains from um, uh, uh, sort of Balkan states, and also just, um, I suppose, more people being prescribed these, mm. these drugs, which is very tricky. Yeah. Mm. Andy, what do you make of it? Well, I think, you know, the, Nash the, the Nuffield Trust are concerned about this, the Epilepsy Society are concerned about this, the National Pharmacy Association are concerned about this, so there is obviously an issue whether mm. or not Brexit to blame, you know, who knows. Yeah. Mm. To start licensing manufacture over here or things or yeah. generics or whatever we need to do because it's not right. Mm. Um, potholes, Andy, making the times again. Um, the, it, the HS2 cash, with, with, with billions upon billions we're saving by not building HS2 yep. past Birmingham. Um, so it should be used to sort out the roads, apparently. Yes. So last autumn, 8.3 billion of money that had been earmarked for HS2 was diverted to uh, tackling potholes, which I think a lot of people would uh, welcome because it is one of the issues that actually most bothers people day to day in their lives. Um, but only 300 million so far has been allocated to actually doing anything, right. which leaves eight billion pounds to be spent. And it says that the time says that uh, that money is going to be spent over an 11 year period. Well, presumably I mean, who, who... we haven't got that money isn't just sitting in a bank account, is it? I mean, this no. is where, you know, it's. No, but 11 years, I mean, who, who is driving down to the end of their road uh, every morning and going, oh, I, I look forward to that being resolved in 10 that's years? That's not how it works, though. You know time. that's not how it works. No, but it's frustrating for people. It's frustrating for people when they're driving down a road and they have to dodge all of these mm. potholes. Yes, but, it's about, but, but if you're saying over an 11-year period, it's about fixing the issues now and then maintaining the roads for 11 years. Absolutely. But you old cynic. I can, <laughs> that's not how the government has positioned it, though, is it? The government Isn't said... It? No. The government said last autumn, many... we are giving £8.3 billion pounds to tackling potholes. Over the next 10 years? That's not how they put it. That Come was on. in the small print. <laughs> Sorry, How do we know we're in an election year? Because we're talking about potholes. Oh, yeah. It gets it, down it, yeah. to the yeah. real yeah, yeah. basics. That's what All people care councils about. have budgets that end up kind of running until the end of March. So we're in a new uh, council budgetary framework. Every single council should make that a priority mm. if they want their local council. We've got our local elections mm. in two weeks' time. Yeah. Get down onto those two roads. Weeks today. Get yeah. digging. Oh, heck, two weeks today. So yeah, is. we're going to be busy. Lucy, yeah. this one's a bit of a worry, isn't it? Uh, in the Times, photo booths install panic buttons for women who need to call for help. Oh, no, you, but this is a really good thing. So, oh. basically, what they're saying is, is that it's another initiative to try to find some safe spaces where women who are at risk have the opportunity to be able to seek help. I see. So, you've probably heard of the idea, Ask for Angela. You go into... Or ask Clive. It gets a bit confusing, yes. though, doesn't who it? Who should I ask for, yeah. exactly? Am I saying the right name? But in... in the, the sort of toilet cubicles in, in bars, in pubs, in hospitals, you can often see a sign on the back door saying, if you're in danger and you need to somehow tell us, use this phrase. And what's happening here, particularly uh, in Italy, they, they trialled this. They called them pink booths, but I hope actually that doesn't... I, I hope they don't change the look of these booths, because you want them to look as anonymous as possible. Mm. But it's the idea is that if you're a woman and you're in danger, you can go into those booths, press a particular button, and actually get put through to a helpline so that you can actually say, um, I'm in danger, I can't use my phone, mm. my partner is, there's coercive control and mm. they're, they're trying to control me. Please, can you help? So, actually, it's a great initiative. Oh, that is initiative. a very good thing. Mm. Mm. How common a problem is it? 
Unfortunately, it's a very big problem and it got worse during COVID. Mm. It got worse during the lockdowns. Um, and also there are so many, the cost of living really does actually exacerbate things like this because financial worries can make partners very, very mm. kind of escalate the abuse. Uh, so, and it, and unfortunately, it doesn't get talked about enough because people feel so ashamed. They feel that they ought to be strong enough to walk away from a particular relationship, that perhaps they, that somehow they're to blame, and they're not. They're not to blame. No, it's no. the way in which the coercive control reduces your sense of self-worth and mm. diminishes you, crushes your spirit. So I think we need anything we can do to help women in this predicament, uh, because actually I, I know firsthand that it's that it's a really it's a really big issue. Yeah, yeah. it's a great initiative. Um, Andy, let's have a look at wind turbines, shall we? Apparently, going to be taller than the shard. <laughs> yeah, this is a German company that's proposing to build wind turbines that are up to 365 meters tall. They're planning to build a thousand of them in the south of Germany. Wow. Um, so anybody who doesn't like the look of wind turbines, and I know it's a common complaint, people think they're ugly, people think they're eyesores. They're not ugly. Uh, I, I quite, don't think I they are. I quite like them. I quite like them. So maybe I'll move to Bavaria where there'll be a thousand maybe you should. in the future <laughs> by 2030. And you can sit um, and watch them. Out of your window. I, think, I think it's quite soothing, don't you think? I, look, I would look agree, that. and I, look, I, I know people, the idea of onshore... Um, is it, oh, yeah, onshore. Onshore wind, yeah. Onshore wind, and people don't like new stuff being built, I get that. But in terms of power generation, it's, they look better than a power station, they look better than all the blooming pylons everywhere and all the rest of it. Got to do something. I think so, and this is quite smart, because not only is it, is it wind, but also there are solar panels on these turbines. Oh, really? It's a double whammy. That is quite You're getting nice. solar energy as well. So I think it's quite smart. But the idea that you have sort of a thousand shard height buildings or higher um, in one place is quite quite startling. But presumably there's lots of space in the south of Germany. Yeah. Yes. Is it loud, Andy? I've no idea. Is I it? I imagine it would be a thousand of them. Are they all just in the same field then? Presumably. Like a forest A, for of a forest of turbines. It might be quite a nice sight actually seeing them all together like that. I don't know, you'd hear something. I, I think so. Even if it's have not you ever the local wish. bird population? <laughs> no. no well, they're going to be avoiding that, like the plague. Have you ever stood underneath one? Uh, no. <laughs> oh, oh, you should do. Are you it's, allowed to? It's, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's phenomenal, because although obviously the blades are a long way off from you, when you, if you, if you stand up and look right up like that, it does, it does feel like they're just heading for you. What are you doing standing under wind, sort of meet me under the... This wind is what turbine at six o'clock. <laughs> what you have to do if you're in all the night. But no, so it's is fascinating. It loud? You can tell us. Well, you can hear them, but it's not loud, loud. No. Just like a whoosh. A whoosh. Oh, that's all right. A gentle whoosh. Um, Lucy, lots of middle-class young women are smoking. Mad, Lucy. No, I just Shouldn't love the idea. You for professional service. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's, it's too late, actually. Oh, <laughs> My oh. thesis on you already. <laughs> um, yes, middle-class young women are. are Taking us with Oh, yeah, researchers are really confused by this because we all know that smoking is bad for your health, but it just seems that there is a cohort of women who are not only continuing smoking despite all of the health risks, but they are doing it in a really interesting way. They're using roll-ups more than they're oh. smoking normal cigarettes. And mm -hmm. what they've often said to the researchers is that it's something to do with actually mitigating anxiety that you might have in social situations, which is really interesting because smoking is really an oral gratification. It's, it's about the way in which you soothe yourself orally. But if you're also fiddling around with the bits and bobs that, that you have to do to roll up your cigarette, I have never done it, clearly. I think that's really obvious. Oh. Um, that actually it gives your hands something to do, uh, which is why mobile phones have also become part of our kind of um, toolkit for managing our anxiety, because it gives our hands as well as our eyes and brain something well, to do. Well, they should roll up something else, shouldn't they, that's healthy. Like some paper. Uh, not. Yes, yeah, <laughs> just roll up paper. That would, so it's very bad for you to smoke. Well, um, it is. It's paper, but it's got tobacco stuffed in it. Well, that's bad, isn't it? <laughs> that's a bad thing. We've got to say, well, we are obliged to say that. that well, if you were born after 2009, you will be able you'll to never be allowed to do it. Anyway. No. So, no. there we are. Um, look, we've just got time to squeeze in a coffee. Will you take me for a coffee after work, Andy? Uh, £265 for a coffee in Mayfair. Oh, now. What's, what's that everywhere? all about? Not everywhere in Mayfair, but at this point, Specific coffee bar, it's called Shot, a small dimly lit coffee bar decked with marble walls and tables in Mayfair. The world's most expensive coffee for 265 quid. Is that for like an espresso? 
It was like uh, a shot. Is it two hundred sixty-five quid a shot? Yes, it is. No, and, stop. and it is. What's it and made it's, of? It, I mean, well, it's from and ja gold or something. It's from Japan, and apparently Japanese coffee is very rare, which explains why it's so expensive. But even, I mean. I'll have a double with, espresso, please. Absolutely. Well, we're hit with... <laughs> no, you won't. Well, that'd oh, be how much price. is that? £530. I mean, really. No, it is astonishing. I mean, £4 for a coffee in London these days, you're kind of nudging the £4 mark, oh, but £265. That yes. is ridiculous. It's a little bit too much. Who's buying it? that? I don't... People with more money than sense, obviously. Well, clearly. I know it sounds horrible, but I hope this company goes out of business. Yeah. <laughs> it's just disgusting. You're so charitable. It's disgusting, though, that, isn't it? It um, is. Andy, Lucy, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Let's have a look at your weather now with Aidan. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello, good morning. Welcome to the latest forecast from the Met Office for GB News. A chilly start in many places today, cloudier in the north with some outbreaks of rain moving in this morning, especially for northern and western Scotland, but a few light outbreaks of rain reaching Northern Ireland later in the morning. And then this area pushes into Northern England and eventually North Wales by the middle of the afternoon. Turning cloudier in many places then, but staying sunny in the East Midlands, East Anglia, Southern England as well, where it will feel pleasantly warm. 15, perhaps 16 Celsius. Not feeling pleasantly warm in the northwest with the wind and the rain. And that rain tends to topple its way southwards during the evening, but it also tends to fizzle away. So not a great deal of rain reaching the south or parts of Wales even. And it will be followed by showers, blustery showers, as the wind picks up overnight. With the breeze overnight, temperatures will stay up in the mid to high single figures, so generally frost free. But it's going to be a blustery start to Friday. Areas of cloud moving south, some light showers for many places. The most frequent showers will be affecting the far north of Scotland. The wind will be feeling cold with that wind strongest along the North Sea coast and there'll be some big waves along the North Sea coast as well. Showers by the afternoon confined to the east of England. Elsewhere, brighter spells emerging, some sunshine and highs of 14 or 15 degrees. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. The latest GB News travel. Good morning, I'm Russell Holding. The M8 in Edinburgh is partly blocked eastbound by an accident between junctions 2 and 1 from the M9 to Hermiston Gate, causing delays. Buses replaced trains between Kilmarnock and Strand Ra after a fire near the railway. On the M56 in Cheshire, the inside lanes closed eastbound between junctions 14 and 12 from Chester to Runcorn for emergency resurfacing to repair damage caused when a lorry caught fire yesterday evening. On the M6 in Warwickshire, there are southbound delays from junction 3 at Coventry to two for the M69 after overnight road works. In London, Kentish Town Road is closed northbound by Camden Town Station for an investigation. Train services between Basingstoke and Salisbury are diverting via Southampton because of a gas leak and there are delays of up to an hour to DFDS sailings between Dover and Dunkirk. That's the latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website gbnews.com. With thanks to Variety Cruises, a family company sailing since 1942, you have the chance to win a £10,000 seven-night small boat cruise for two. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, you'll be able to choose from any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and explore Greece like never before. Plus, you'll also win £10,000 in tax-free cash to make your summer sizzle. And we'll pack you off with these luxury travel gifts. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04, PO Box 8690, Derby DE19T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck.
Good morning to you. It's 7 o'clock on Thursday, the 18th of April. Today, another scandal hits the Tory party as the MP Mark Menzies loses the whip over claims he misused campaign funds. Yes, Rishi Sunak can't afford another headache, but that's exactly what he's got with Mark Menzies losing the whip. Find out more with me very soon. The Prince of Wales will today return to official public duties for the first time since the Princess of Wales revealed her cancer diagnosis. Well, travel carnage continues in Dubai as flash flooding devastates the city. We spoke to one British expat earlier on. Unfortunately, um, some people ha are still stuck in their properties. Some people's homes have been flooded. It really has been a, a very scary time for us all here. Law enforcement bust an illegal website used by cyber criminals to defraud thousands of UK victims. 70 asylum seekers are moved out of a former RAF base after major safety risks emerge. 70 residents of former RAF Weathersfield are now back in expensive hotels over fears due to contamination and unexploded ordnance. I'll have the details. With smoking set to be banned for those born after 2009 over health risks, we're asking, is it time for the government to get tougher on alcohol too? We'll be debating that shortly. And in the sport, in the Champions League, Manchester City are knocked out on penalties to Real Madrid, whilst Arsenal lose to Bayern Munich. Now, with the Olympics in Paris this year, nobody wants the Commonwealth Games in 2026. So Glasgow could be the answer. And personally, as sport, pastimes and fashion specialist here at GB News, I'll be combining all three with Olympic opening ceremony clothing. It's a beautiful start out there for many places and there's more sunshine to come this weekend. But before that happens, there is some rain to talk about in the forecast coming up shortly. Morning to you. I'm Stephen Dixon. And I'm Ellie Costello and this is Breakfast on GB News. Um, the expensive coffee we were talking about a minute ago, £265 per shot. It's in Mayfair in London. I mean, who is going to buy it? Well... Frankly, I, who? I was thinking of you because when we went to a coffee shop, which we probably shouldn't name... No, but... ..close to here, mm. it was how much for four coffees? It was four coffees. We were with Paul Coit and his daughter, daughter and I think two or three of you had like a croissant or something, yeah. and it was about £38. And it, you, you almost had a heart attack. I almost died. <laughs> and it's literally... Um, <laughs> it's it's literally just like a little coffee shop and, and the, bakery. And the coffee comes out like this, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, and the I pastry wasn't, comes out like this. I wasn't even paying. I know. Paul Coit was paying. Paul Coit paying. I mean, I nearly died. Paul Coit, I had to pick him up off the floor. Thir it was about 38 quid. Oh, Paul Coit. I mean, Paul, Paul Coit, that's a difficult thing to say. It's a disgrace. I know, it is. It's an absolute disgrace. Anyway, 265 quid for a shot of coffee. I mean, that takes the biscuit, doesn't it? Uh, ben Purdy, hi Ben, says uh, the NHS hierarchy are drinking it to reduce stress. Oh, yeah, very good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, John Andrews has said, has Ellie brought you any cookies or cake today, Steve? No. No, it's not, no. No. And earlier on, we were talking about smoking and young women taking up smoking. And I had to say, smoking is bad, don't do it. Uh, David, uh, David's been in touch and said, if GB presenters are obliged to say smoking is bad, then it's all about the nanny state winning the day. There are certain guidelines that you can't promote things which are known to be bad. It's why there are warnings on cigarette packets. Everybody knows it's bad, but what you can't do is promote it as a thing. So I'm just, it's just got to cover our backs. There are rules and regs, and whether you like them or not, You've got to be there. I mean, it makes sense in a way. You can't sort of... You don't know who's watching. Kids are watching. Mm. You've, got, you've got to just... Um, we've also been talking about cheap travel destinations. Apparently, some of the Greek islands are the cheapest places to go this year, according to which Mary's been in touch saying Malta. She just moved back from Malta after 11 years. Oh. It's full of building work and cranes. It's cheap for a reason. Be very oh. careful where you stay. Greedy developers have spoiled it, she says. Oh, Maybe well, that's why it's go. cheap this year. 
Uh, we're talking about um, wind turbines in the papers as well. They're looking, in Germany, building ones higher than the Shard. A thousand of them. Paul Farrow says, and I've heard this before, I mean, I just don't know how true it is. Um, wind turbines are not eco-friendly. They use vast amounts of oil for lubrication and maintenance. Mm. Plus, he says, we've nowhere to store the energy that's produced. St energy storage is a big problem. Yeah. And there's all these claims that it, it would take a wind turbine a decade or something to recoup the amount of carbon that's used in their manufacture. There's all this sort of thing. It's the same with batteries for electric cars and all the rest of it. How you balance all that out into doing something which is actually sustainable, I don't know. Mm. I don't know. There you go. The, the oil for lubrication. Maybe they use eco-oil. I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. It's a pathway, isn't it, with all You these do wonder things. how... Because uh, I tell you what, because all the electric cars and all the rest of it, you know, all, all well and good, all fine. But you see, um, you see, if you see McDonald's trucks on the motorway, they all say, we're driven using eco-diesel. Yeah, biofuel. And... Biofuel from the, from the f fat that they use to fry your chips and chicken. Mm. Um, and I saw something the other day saying it was being powered by food waste and cow manure, oh. apparently. So if you can do all of this to fuel lorries and cars and things, why aren't we doing it? With our wind turbines. And doesn't the king have a car that he runs on cheese and wine? Or have I made that up? Not cheese. I don't think it's cheese. <laughs> wine, no. Cheese and wine. wine. I don't have your show. Hold the line. <laughs> I don't think I've Miller, made that up. <laughs> more cheese in the engine. Add the cheese. I think it is cheese and wine. Exactly. Prince Charles reveals his car runs on cheese and wine. <laughs> I retain this sort of information. How do you th what does cheese do? Well, I don't Touch. know. I don't run it. Shove a slice in. Yeah. He says uh, white wine and whey. Whey. Oh, cheese whey. The cheese process. Right. Oh, there you go. I had the right yeah, idea. Someone said on a power. <laughs> I, I had the right idea. <laughs> Someone said on social media, this is in The Guardian, I hope he drives carefully. Yes, very carefully. good. <laughs> oh, very dear. good. So he does, technically. Cheese and wine. Turn it on cheese and wine. What a waste of cheese and wine, though, to be fair. Uh, maybe it's the waste products of cheese and wine. Yeah. That's you, fine. Imagine getting out another, <laughs> imagine another bottle of champagne, dear. <gasps> yeah, no, well, that. he's probably got the money to do that, hasn't But he? there's all these sort of things that we can do, right? And um, biodiesel, I'm all, you know, why not? You're all for it. It works. Well, let us know your thoughts. www.gbnews.com slash your say. Oh, Still well getting done. used to that. Yeah, yeah well done. Yeah. Yeah. Well remembered. Uh, right, let's kick off with the news, though, which is bad news for the government again, because there's another scandal hitting the Tory party. The MP, Mark Menzies, has lost the party whip over the alleged misuse of campaign funds. Now, it's quite a complex story, this one. Yeah, it is. Number 10 have launched an investigation into the matter. Menzies is now no longer a member of the Tory party and will sit as an independent MP in the House of Commons. Um, he's issued a statement saying, I dispute the allegations put to me. I've complied with all the rules for declarations. Um, as there's an investigation ongoing, I won't comment any further. Well, we're joined now by our political correspondent, Olivia Utley. As we were just saying, Olivia, this is a little bit complicated, so you can uh, explain all of this to us, but it is essentially another scandal to hit the Tory party in an election year, and it's a real headache for Rishi Sunak, isn't it? It definitely is, and it has the whiff of quite a big scandal. It is complicated, but what it boils down to is that Mark Menzies used £14,000 of money donated to the Conservative Party, ring-fenced, obviously, for use in campaigning, for his own personal use. That's the allegation that uh, the Times newspaper has made today. There is also um, an allegation that uh, Mark Menzies called his former campaign manager, a 78-year-old woman, in the middle of the night, three in the morning, and asked her to transfer him five £5,000 from campaign funds. She didn't. Um, and in the morning, he asked for it to be transferred uh, from uh, from his new campaign manager. She, and she did indeed transfer it. Now, it's not clear if he was being blackmailed, but I think that is the suggestion at the moment. Altogether, this amounts to tens of thousands of pounds. And what makes this particularly worrying for Rishi Sunak and for the Conservative Party is that the allegations were actually made three months ago 
But until today, the story hasn't broken, and obviously Mark Wenzies has only just been stripped of the Conservative whip. Why has it taken so long? There's going to be a lot of questions for Simon Hart, uh, the chief whip, and for the Prime Minister himself. For the time being, though, it is very bad news for Rishi Sunak. He's already lost six Conservative MPs, quite a lot of them through scandals, most recently, of course, uh, William Ragg. And he can't really afford to be hemorrhaging MPs in the run-up to a general election. OK. Olivia, thanks very much indeed. Well, the Conservative Party have also issued a statement saying the Conservative Party is investigating allegations made regarding a Member of Parliament. This process is rightfully confidential. The party takes all allegations seriously and will always investigate any matters put to them. Now, the Home Office has been forced to move asylum seekers out of a former RAF base in Essex after safety concerns were raised about the site. Well, our reporter Ray Addison is there for us now. Good to see you this morning, Ray, and tell us more. Well, it's interesting, isn't it, because this site was assessed as safe and fit for purpose by the Home Office uh, just a matter of uh, 10 months ago. And now, of course, after they've uh, 10 months after they've moved in, a reported 70 asylum seekers have been moved out and back into those expensive hotels that we know the government is very keen to stop using. Now, why have they gone? Well, of course, those safety risks have been raised concerns over the potential for radiological contamination and, very worryingly, uh, particularly for the residents inside, unexploded ordnance as well. Now, this uh, former RAF airbase is currently being used as one of the Home Office's largest mass accommodation sites. It can accommodate uh, up to 800 people. However, they won't tell us exactly how many people are here at the moment. But they received planning permission uh, to use this site for three years and they got that last month. They got a special development order, or an SDO, uh, which circumvented... Uh council planning permission and there were concerns raised in this SDO at the time uh, of risks of contamination from gases, radiological contamination and that unexploded audience uh, ordinance that we've been talking about as well. Of course it's not the only site where we've had this problem. Uh, RAF Scampton as well in Lincolnshire um, that was expected to open this month but has been reportedly um, been delayed now until June. Now I've been here here for about an hour this morning and um, I did get the chance to have a quick um, conversation as they were walking off with a couple of residents here this morning. Here's what they had to say. You have a quick chat? No? Are you guys worried about the contamination on the site? Where are you off to? Where are you going? Oh, where, what, what job do you have? Well, it's interesting there. I don't know if you, it was sort of hard to work out. I was trying to figure out if they said they were going walking or working. It sounded like working. I've listened back to it a couple of times now. Of course, um, asylum seekers um, having their claims processed are not allowed to work. Um, so there might be some questions raised there. A Home Office spokesman said, Wethersfield is safe for asylum seekers and we're working at pace to ensure we abide by the conditions in the special development order. The Home Secretary, we know, has been ordered to initiate a programme of intrusive ground investigation investigations to assess contamination. Who knows, as that process continues, it's possible we may see more um, residents here having to be moved back into hotels. Uh, I also reached out to Braintree District Council. Um, Graham Butland is the leader, and he said that the council's written to the Home Office requesting urgent copies of all the relevant technical documents and plans under the SDO to support their duty in safeguarding the interests of the local community. OK, Ray Addison, thank you very much indeed. Well, in response, the Home Office has had this to say. We have always been clear the use of asylum hotels is unacceptable, which is why we moved asylum seekers to former military sites, which we ensure are safe to accommodate asylum seekers prior to use. Well, or perhaps not mm. in this case. I mean, un unexploded ordinance... Oh, heck... Mm. <laughs>
beggar's belief. It really does. Now, dozens of suspected cyber fraudsters have been arrested across the UK after authorities brought down an illegal website used by thousands of criminals to defraud victims worldwide. Well, police have identified at least 70,000 victims in the UK alone as sophisticated online enablers train criminals to set up fake websites to scam victims into handing over their personal details. Mark White has the story. Across the UK, dozens of suspected cyber criminals had a rude awakening as law enforcement here and around the globe moved in to smash a multi-million pound online scam that's defrauded many thousands of victims. Multiple addresses were raided and some suspects were pulled off flights at Manchester and Luton airports. You have been identified as uh, involved in LabHost, an online phishing platform which allows users to set up fraudulent websites in order to impersonate online services such as banking. This is now the front page greeting any would-be cyber criminal trying to access the services of this illegal online site. The website LabHost is part of a hugely worrying development in cybercrime. It aimed to provide an easy step-by-step -step guide on how to download and use fake sites. Your page has installed and you're ready to spam. Make sure to check that it works before starting your spam. Stay safe and good spamming. Unsuspecting members of the public would then believe those sites were pages from legitimate businesses like banks and retailers all with the aim of phishing, of fooling victims into revealing personal details which would be used to commit fraud. There are unfortunately many enabling services to fraud. However, together with our law enforcement partners, we are um, tackling them. To take out an enabler means that we are able to um, take it out at source and this, we hope, will send out a message to those using similar services that we can get their data and we will be onto them. Law enforcement have identified at least 70,000 victims of this latest cyber scam in the UK alone. The lab host site made more than a million pounds from 2,000 criminals who subscribed to download its services. Those attempting to access the site now are faced with a bit of online trolling from law enforcement. You've targeted victims all around the world. The police there may not be too happy with you. Think carefully about where you go on holiday next. That was your 2023 lab host wrapped. Lab host is dead now. With that illegal site now infiltrated and disrupted by authorities, dozens of those it was training and equipping in the art of cyber fraud are in police custody and likely facing prosecution. Mark White, GB News. Now, there's chaos in the United Arab Emirates as thousands of UK travellers are struggling to get home. Never mind the people who live there. Yeah. Um, after all this dreadful weather and flash flooding closed the airport and there's just roads absolutely flooded, cars abandoned and everything. It's been horrific. No, it really has. Well, the airport has urged passengers to stay away unless absolutely necessary after it has hit with more than a year's worth of rainfall in the space of 24 hours. Well, one man has lost his life as a result of the bad weather and earlier we spoke to British expat Kerish Bryant. Oh my goodness, it has been chaos indeed. We've seen so much happening in 24 hours. I think we're still in shock. The roads have been flooded. Cars are still stranded in the streets. Um, you can see the aftermath of blown down um, signs and boards all over the city. Unfortunately, um, some people ha are still stuck in their properties. Some people's homes have been flooded. It really has been a, a very scary time for us all here. Harish, how have you been affected? Has your apartment been flooded? Have you been able to get out and about? Oh, goodness me. In the words of batting down the hatches, we was closing the windows and doors with all of our force, barricading ourselves in with towels. Um, it's safe to say some of the older apartments in Dubai have not been built for this weather. So we uh, have a very big laundry bill uh, coming our way for the towels and blankets used to stop the rain from coming in. I mean, presumably somewhere like Dubai just isn't 
built for this, hasn't got the, I don't know, even the sort of drainage to deal with this level of rainfall in such a short amount of time. Correct. I mean, we are in the middle of the desert um, and the sewer systems have been thought about. It's something that a lot of people have researched, um, but you must remember, if it's not going to be filled with water, it will be filled with sand. So we have to have a compromise. We was never expecting this type of rainfall. It's been over 75 years since we've had such rainfall in the UAE. And 75 years ago, what you see now was just a vision, just a dream. And what have the authorities been telling you there? I mean, we're, we're hearing about the airport there uh, and the disruption to people trying to get out. But what, what advice are you being given? The advice we've been given from our local authorities um, has been to stay safe and stay indoors for as, as long as possible, to stock up on all utensils and food just to make sure you are safe if you are trapped anywhere, um, and also just to kind of look out for one another as well. Well, talking there about the horrendous weather in Dubai, do let us know if you've been affected by that, by the way. If you've been out there on holiday or you know people that have been, do let us know. I'd love to talk to you, actually. GB, tell me, gbnews.com. gbnews.com slash your say. That's it. Uh, but at least we can say the weather here might be a bit miserable, but it's nothing as bad as what we've been seeing in Dubai. Aidan McGiven has all the details. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello, good morning. Welcome to the latest forecast from the Met Office for GB News. A chilly start in many places today, cloudier in the north with some outbreaks of rain moving in this morning, especially for northern and western Scotland. But a few light outbreaks of rain reaching Northern Ireland later in the morning and then this area pushes into Northern England and eventually North Wales by the middle of the afternoon. Turning cloudier in many places then, but staying sunny in the East Midlands, East Anglia, Southern England as well, where it will feel pleasantly warm, 15, perhaps 16 Celsius. Not feeling pleasantly warm in the northwest with the wind and the rain. And that rain tends to topple its way southwards during the evening, but it also tends to fizzle away, so not a great deal of rain reaching the south or parts of Wales even. And it will be followed by showers, blustery showers, as the wind picks up overnight. With the breeze overnight, temperatures will stay up in the mid to high single figures, so generally frost-free, but it's going to be a blustery start to Friday. Areas of cloud moving south, some light showers for many places. The most frequent showers will be affecting the far north of Scotland. The wind will be feeling cold with that wind strongest along the North Sea coast and there'll be some big waves along the North Sea coast as well. Showers by the afternoon confined to the east of England. Elsewhere, brighter spells emerging, some sunshine and highs of 14 or 15 degrees. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Now, don't miss out on your chance to win a £10,000 Greek cruise, a luxury travel bundle and a whopping £10,000 in tax-free cash. Yes, it's our biggest prize of the year so far and here's how it could all be yours. With thanks to Variety Cruises, a family company sailing since 1942, you have the chance to win a £10,000 seven-night small boat cruise for two. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, you'll be able to choose from any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and explore Greece like never before. Plus, you'll also win £10,000 in tax-free cash to make your summer sizzle. And we'll pack you off with these luxury travel gifts. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text WIN to 63232. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04, PO Box 8690, Derby DE19T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash WIN. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. You can do it, yeah. I Thank was just you. I was just going to say though, Thank before you. that, oh, yeah, for those yeah. of you who, you know, I mean that's a very, very fancy prize, that one. And most of us haven't got that sort of money. However, uh, looking after your money, and we have been talking about scams today. Christopher's been in touch. Hi, Christopher. He says, I was scammed yesterday on Facebook. Oh. But my bank did their job and stopped the transaction. Well, good. 
good for you. Thank, I mean, the banks are good when they, they do good, that yeah. sort of thing. Um, so there you go. So lo loads of you getting in touch this morning. A whole host of different issues. GBnews.com slash you'll say Tony's been in touch. Lee Drake. Oh, morning, Lee. Very good. Uh, Pat Stedman. Loads of you getting in touch. So we're reading through all of them. Yes, do keep them coming in. And you'll also have an opinion on this one. Mm. Should there be stricter rules on alcohol? We're going to be discussing that next. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's Live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister. And we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. If you want your news to be straight talking. This is the nightmare for the Conservatives again. Down to earth. It's not just Nottingham where this is happening, is it? And most importantly, honest. Hard-working, middle-class taxpayers, they'll get their book thrown at them. Then catch me, Martin Daubney, Monday to Friday, 3 to 6 p.m. on GB News, Britain's news channel. In the GB newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens. With our team of dedicated journalists across the UK, GB News brings you accurate reporting of the day's topical agenda. When the news breaks, wherever and whenever it's happening, we'll be there. This is GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back to breakfast. The time is 28 minutes past seven. Now, smoking is set to be banned for those born after 2009, and critics have pointed out the negative impacts that drinking can also have on your health. Yeah, um, well, of course, if you're over 18, uh, you can buy and drink alcohol. We know that. So we're asking, should the government get tougher on drinking now? Mm, well, joining us now is the owner of The Sandin, Kate Stewart, and the author of I'm Never Drinking Again, Dom McGregor. Very good to see you both. I think it's quite clear which side of the debate both of you uh, sit on. <laughs> uh, Kate, let's start with you, shall we? Do you think that the government needs to get stricter with alcohol? The thing is, with alcohol, it's been around forever, mm. for absolute ever. The first pub was established in 1947. Um, pubs bring £100 billion revenue into the economy every single year. It, the hospitality industry employs three and a half million people. It's like everything. Everything is good in moderation. And, you know, we need pubs. During lockdown, people were craving to be together, and that's what pubs are for. They are for socialising, they are for coming together, and we need them in this country. 
It's hard to argue against that, Dom, isn't it? I mean, so how do I mean, how would you regulate alcohol more in your w without damaging an industry? Um, I kind of uh, really disagree with the fact that the only way people can get together is at pubs. You know, there's plenty of ways people can spend time together uh, and healthier time can be spent together rather than being centred around alcohol. Uh, and just because something's been around since for 500 years doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. Um, you know, we get more insights and more data on things and the world changes a little bit and we wake up to these um, issues that alcohol faces. Uh, alcohol is already on the same trajectory as smoking anyway. Uh, young people aren't doing it. Uh, pubs are closing at record rates. So... Um, I think, from my perspective, when we're actually yeah, but taking forgive a step me, back here, for, for, forgive me, Don. Um, pubs are closing at record rates. That's absolutely. It's not because people don't want to drink, is it? It's because they're buying it elsewhere. Uh, yeah, that's obviously true. But if we take a step back and what we actually realise we're actually talking about here is an addictive drug. Mm. It which is, is a poison, it, which it, costs it, lives and is highly addictive. And uh, all the data points to alcohol dependency, not just addiction as a killer. OK, Kate, what do you say to that? It's addictive and it costs lives. So the thing is, it's like everything, isn't it? So if people are not drinking in pubs, if you're drinking in a pub, you've got a public and a licensee there to say, we're not saving you no more, you've had enough. At home, you can go to the supermarket, you can buy as much alcohol as you want and you can drink as much as you want. I also own a CIC, which is recovery housing for people who've suffered from addiction, so I see both sides of it. The people who, service users who live in my properties, they live by pubs. It doesn't bother them. They know they've got an addiction. The thing that has to be done is that people need educating. So when you've had enough, it's enough. But as I said, in a pub, there is someone there to say, no, you've had enough, the door's closed, you can sit in your house and drink all night, no one stops you. We need pubs. Yeah, well, yeah I mean... I'm, I'm not disagreeing about having places for people to come together, but when, when we look at alcohol, what alcohol is, it's an it's it's emotional reaction to how people uh, live their lives. And we've got marketing, which is pushing emotional connection with alcohol constantly. Um, and people will drink in pubs, but also people will then hide their addiction as much as they can at home. And uh, it's actually not the pubs that's an issue, it's the alcohol in general, um, yeah. where we get people drinking from young ages and increasing the chance of dependency up to 50% by the time they're 21, 22 years old. But what about free choice, Dom? In all, I mean, and I, that, I, you know, I don't drink anymore. I used to. I used to love a drink. I don't drink anymore. I haven't had a drink for 20 years. However, I'm, I, I wouldn't want to stop other people from having a drink if they enjoy it. We've got, we've got a right to make our own decisions, haven't we? 100%, and I think that I'm actually against the banning of anything. You know, we're all old enough to make our own choices. But when we've got um, the amount, and we take betting as a similar example, when we've got the amount of money spent in marketing pushing these products to people constantly, 24-7, there's no reason people fall, form addictions in these spaces. So when we look at strict, strict laws around alcohol, it, for me, it has to look at the um, marketing of it, but also access to it from um, different times and different ages. I think Scotland have introduced a lot of regulations which are actually quite um, good for people. Mm. Kate, what do you make of that? I just think as well, it is, if you've got an addictive personality, you aren't going to get that from anywhere. Um, it doesn't stop. No way. We're talking about people who consume far too much alcohol. Yes, people need educating, and maybe there should be stipulations on the advertising, advertising to young people. The age restriction is 18 and should stay 18. Um, and I just think it is all based on education, but fundamentally, it's people's choice whether they drink or not. And there's absolutely millions of people outside the UK who do drink in moderation and drink correctly. Yeah. I think the, the one thing I would say about the education piece is it's very difficult to educate people 18, 19 year old and they don't know actually the full impact of things. And by the time actually they've been drinking for one, two years, they could already have dependency issues. You've got one eighth of people who have uh, been proven to have a gene which is leaning towards addiction. So we're speaking about. I think that's, what, 5 million people potentially in the UK who could face addiction problems in the future. And unfortunately, sometimes that's already hardwired by the time they get to 18 years old. Yeah, maybe so. Maybe so. And I, I've got sympathies with people like that. I think it's just it's the big brother element of it all. Yeah. Isn't it? I don't know. Anyway, look, Don McGregor, thank you very much indeed. Good to see you. Kate Stewart, delight. I, I, it's always good, Kate, when we have someone with a Northwest accent on. Mm. I'm saying no more. But I love it. It reminds <laughs> me of being well. back up home. Eh? I'm up in the North West as well.
Oh, well, well, there you go. Well, there you well, go. Well, you've got two of you then. Double. We, we two for the price of one. Two for the price of one. We can't, <laughs> we, we can't hear you overly clearly in the, here in the studio, Dom, but um, I didn't pick up on that, but thank you. Uh, so there you go. It's like a Northwest fiesta here. Yeah, very drinking good. and not drinking. Yes. Whichever you fancy. I, say, I, I do think people need to drink in moderation. I do not overdo it, but um, you can't you can't be big brother over it all. Yeah, nanny statism of it all. You've got to let, you've got to let people make their own decisions. Mm. We know it's harmful, don't we? Just like we know junk food is harmful. Or... Yeah, it's got to do it, you know, all in, in moderation. moderation. That's what we're saying. And as uh, Steve Miller would say, from a former Fat Families presenter, yes. uh, a little bit of what you fancy does you good. Oh, he does say that. He does say that. And quite he's not a northerner. <laughs> There's a the theme. There's a the theme. There anyway, uh, look, don't go anywhere. We've got all the sport heading your way in just a minute with Paul Coit. The latest GB News travel. Good morning, I'm Russell Holding. The M8 in Edinburgh is partly blocked eastbound by an accident between junctions 2 and 1 from the M9 to Hermiston Gate, causing queues. Buses replaced trains between Kilmarnock and Stranra after a fire near the railway line. On the M6 in the West Midlands, two out of three lanes are closed southbound after an accident between junctions 6 and 5 south of Spaghetti Junction, Birmingham. It's taking nearly an hour in queues towards there. And on the M6 in Warwickshire, there's a lane closed southbound after an accident between junction 4 for the M42 and and the M6 toll. In Suffolk, the A14 is blocked westbound it's before Junction 45 at Ruffham with queues from Junction 46. Train services are suspended between Basingstoke and Salisbury, converting via Southampton because of a gas leak near the railway. And in Somerset, the A361 is closed each way between Dean and Leighton after an accident yesterday evening. It's the latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website, gbnews.com. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Are the newspapers getting you down? My wife didn't divorce me that month. <laughs> <laughs> Struggling to separate the wheat from the chaff. I know that it's a bit of a circus at the best of times. <laughs> well, don't worry. Headliners has got you covered. We'll take the burden of reading the day's news, and if we get depressed, who cares? It's an occupational hazard, frankly. That's Headliners on GB News from 11pm till midnight, and the following morning, 5 till 6am, on GB News, the comedy channel. Nah, just kidding. Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria Di Piero, bringing you PMQ's Live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister. And we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Welcome back. It's time to go through all of the latest sports news. Paul Coit is here with us. Hello. 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 Well, where, do, where should we start? Should we go should with, start with the football. Champions League last oh, night? Oh, I think we should. Yes. OK. Arsenal. We were going to mention <laughs> Arsenal. <laughs> Arsenal. Um, Arsenal are out of the Champions League. They're beaten by Bayern Munich um, at the Allianz Stadium last night. So, unfortunately, Arsenal are out. They could have made it to the semi-final. You know, it was such a good game uh, at the Emirates, and then they've gone over to Munich uh, and lost 1-0. And uh, so, anyway, that's all over for them. Manchester City uh, against Real Madrid. Again, this was another game that was hanging in the balance. Um, Real Madrid went ahead very early. Then it was just all Manchester City, just... 
surging forward, surging forward. Could they get that goal? They finally did. 76 minutes. Kevin De Bruyne went to extra time, went to penalties, the dreaded penalties, which I say dreaded, they're only dreaded if you lose, if you win. Oh, it's fantastic, a penalty shootout. Bernardo Silva, you'd expect him to score. Probably one of the worst penalties I've ever seen, just straight at the keeper. Little, little loopy donkey drop. Straight into the keeper's hands. I think it's a donkey drop, isn't it? I don't know. <laughs> yes. Never heard of one of those? No. It's just like that. It's just, just like, sort of like straight that. to him. Yeah, it was, just like, it was just like, there you go. And he's like, oh, thanks very much. It was like, what are you thinking? Uh, Maciej Kovacic, that was saved as well. So that's it. It's out for... They're the champions. And it's all over for them. So Bayern Munich will now play Real Madrid in one semi-final. And then we've got Borussia Dortmund, who will play Paris Saint-Germain in the other semi-final. But right. we do still have English teams in the Europa League. Right. Just about hanging on. Liverpool, who lost 4-0 against Atalanta. Mm. They've got to play over in Italy, so that's tonight. So, the, you know what? Do you think there's a chance? What, a 3-0... 4-0 oh, four. Four deficit? 4, yeah. That's... No, well, they basically. They turned over in, when they were losing 3-0 to Real Madrid. This was a few years ago. But, I don't know, it's going to be tough over there. And then you've got West Ham, we wish them well, who are playing oh. um, Ellie's favourite team, who are... Um, by Bayer Leverkusen, Leverkusen in yes. the uh, Bundesliga. In the Bundesliga. They used to call them Bayer Neverkusen because they really? never win the oh, title yeah. and they now have. And now they're doing great. I don't know why they did because I don't know whether never is actually a German word, but that's what they did call them. But they're playing West Ham tonight. They're 2-0 up. So if, if West Ham... Well, 2-0 down West Ham are. So hopefully West Ham can turn that over. And Aston Villa playing Lille in the conference. Right. Would you um, like to do the fashion? Yeah, Ooh, I yeah. think we should do a bit of fashion, Olympic fashion. Olympic fashion. Well, it is, I mean, it is, it is the Paris Olympics. If it's not fashionable, there's going to be a problem. I agree. So, shall we look at what, what the Parisians, what the French are going to be wearing for the opening ceremony? This all of... I'll talk you through it. Oh. Uh, it's, it's designer Bellucci there, the navy wool suit with coloured silk lapel, tuxedo-inspired outfit using noble materials and patina effects. you know what patina effects are? No. It's kind of like a little metally reflective effect. Oh, is that what's on the colour? That's, that's it. Oh, which I don't is like that at all. It looks like a magician's outfit. Do you think so? Oh, yeah. I like it. I'd rather you like it. like it. So the whole... Sure the shoes. The shoes. Oh, oh, I like the shoes. Look at the shoes. Shoes, shoes. shoes are all right. Uh, the blazer's horrific. You don't like it? No, it's a red it's and blue motif inspired by the French flag. Women will have a cutaway oh, no, the, sleeve, Ellie. The trainers are dreadful too. So there we are. Okay, oh, well, no. like you're not in the French team, then, aren't it? No, I well, think. What about Marrakesh? Should we go to USA? And oh see yeah, what well, yeah. Oh, dread. Oh, oh no. That's not like Ralph it. Lauren. You can no. Tell it's Ralph Lauren. Oh, it's got USA written stitched on it's in massive very letters. Listen to you too. It's the classic preppy look. Oh, I love that. That's nice. Sporty and stylish designs in red, white, and blue, made with a thoughtful consideration of material. And manufacturing choices. No. See, I like that 1930s oh, I like that. look. That's not. Oh, I like that. Oh, I'd buy that myself. No. Because you see those all the time, though. It, it, it is. It's you? just like it's been bought out of a shop. Yeah. Which is I'm why I like Tommy Hilfinger or whatever it's called. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so what do we think then? So for the French one, you, you like I, the French one. I quite one, like don't the French you? one. I like the French one, you're but you're not mad, happy with the both French. of you. No, the US. The you go with the American. Sure. That's okay. lovely, that is. All right. Well, in that case, you can in tell the next it's I will go with Australia and Canada. We'll have a look at those. Oh, yeah. Right. Of those. Yeah. yeah. I think the USA one will be tough to beat. Okay. I'm Give throw over. It out there now. Just like they've just pulled a jumper on and a denim jacket. I mean, there's a denim jacket. Yeah, lovely. They're, they're the type that would wear the jumper or the sweater. They tie it round their neck. Oh. It's like, well, oh, no. Well, you tie your socks around your ankles? No, no that's what are you a good look. Around your neck for? You've got to wear it. That's yeah. a good look. Yeah. I, oh, it's Ellie preppy. Costello. And you can keep it afterwards. It's multiple use, you know? You're so Ivy League. I know. I don't even know what that means. No. I don't know, but I like the sound of it. <laughs> I like it. I see. <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> I don't like it when we clash over things. No. You can have the ugly French one and I'll have the Ralph Lauren. Just don't address the same. You don't want to address the same. No. Oh. No, we don't want to address the same. Um, Although um, we do every day. Can I just say I'm disappointed in you? I'm disappointed in you. <laughs> very poor taste in Olympic fashion. But if it makes it better, I'm disappointed in the both of you. Oh, thanks oh. very much indeed. Thanks, Dad. Right, we'll see Paul later with more fashion news. Uh, <laughs> still to come... Oh, Jeff uh, Banks. Uh, Jeff... <laughs> oh. Jeff... Oh, hi, Jeff Remember Banks. Jeff Banks? From what was that show called? It was The Clothes Show. The Clothes Show? Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, the Pet Shop Boys, the theme tune to that. That's right. Oh, very good. Oh, that's going back yeah. about 40 years. <laughs> uh, now, have you had to renew your car insurance recently? Because yes. it's very expensive. You're telling me. Breaking news. It's expensive. It's extortionate. It is crazy. Anyway, we'll talk about it in the papers in just a moment.
Banana a Queer. Weekends from 3 p.m. J.K. Rowling has accused politicians of snuggling up to trans campaigners. The Harry Potter author has called for an investigation into why political parties are embracing the language of pro-trans groups. So is it time to ditch campaign groups such as those? Well, welcome again to my clashes, former Labour Party advisor Matthew Laza, also businessman and activist Adam Brooks. I think the cash report is really welcome. I think there's been a huge amount of agreement, including from some uh, trans rights campaigners, that there's an awful lot of good in the cash report. I, I, I think that I'm more concerned about Mermaids, which is currently under a charity commission uh, investigation, uh, and some of the reports, if they're to be believed, like sending out chest binders, are more alarming. Mm. I think on Stonewall, which has been just done such great work uh, over the past 30 years uh, uh, on LGBT rights. It said what two year olds could be trans. Now, that, that is one of the most horrifying things I read today. Actually, JK Rowling tweeted that out there. To say that a two year old can think that they can be another gender when my four year old still thinks she's Elsa on some days. You yeah. know, there's no common sense. And, and it, to me, it's I very, think it was very badly phrased. It's, that, very, I agree. it's very sinister that these people actually believe that these kids want to change gender and and unfortunately out there there are parents that almost see a trans kid as a fashion accessory now and i think this whole um agenda has pushed on people that this is normal to change gender and we have to push back and as i said earlier to be trans is not normal. Well, I don't, I don't, I don't agree it's with that extreme. I think, no, I think it's, it's, I think extreme. it's a big step, Adam, but there are clearly people throughout history uh, uh, who, who have uh, been But it's trans. not normal behaviour, is it? I think, for, I think as far as children are concerned, children need to be given the space uh, to, um, uh, to explore the world, and that can mm. include experimenting with, uh, you know, um, uh, breaking previous gender stereotypes. That doesn't mean that people should be sort of labelled at the age of two, which I completely uh, disagree mm. with. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Mm. <coughs> oh, excuse oh. me. Excuse you. Excuse me, I do apologise. Uh, time for the papers this morning with political commentator Andy Williams and psychotherapist Lucy Beresford, who thinks she's having a group session here this morning <laughs> uh, with us a lot. We might need uh, it. <laughs> we might need it. Andy, let's have a look at the time, should we, in this uh, latest Tory MP scandal. Yeah, so, I mean, we're getting, <coughs> excuse me, very used to these. Another uh, MP uh, scandal. I think the really interesting thing here is that the Conservatives won a majority of 80 in 2019, and they've lost so many MPs, that's now down to 49. I mean, there are now 18 independent MPs because so many people have been suspended or have lost the whip. Um, so this is just another, the latest in a long line of people who have um, uh, come a cropper, and it's another headache for Ishii Sunak. Mm. Well, so we've got to be care a little bit careful what we mm. say, on that, but it, there's a lot of questions to be answered about this one. Mm. But anyway, um, all right, let's move swiftly on then to uh, Lucy and um, Rishi Sunak banning smoking for anyone born after 2009. We've been asking about alcohol this morning. Apparently, he wants to go for phones next. It is interesting that his legacy could very well be about the things that he banned rather than the things that he built, the things mm. that he created. But nevertheless, some research of parents suggested that 83% of them felt that smartphones were damaging and harmful to their children. Now, you could argue 
if you're the parent, it's up to you as to whether you get a phone for your kid. But so many parents don't want their child to be the only one in the classroom mm. that doesn't have. You know, I remember the days when you were the only person that didn't watch ITV, for example, you know, if you had super strict parents. Uh, so there is that peer pressure. Mm. But there is a book by Jonathan Haidt, he's a psychologist. Uh, Rishi Sunak apparently is telling everyone to read this book and it's talking about how smartphones have basically almost rewired the brains of children mm. and we know from the castle that's book, true? yes absolutely oh. for, well it, it it's had the effect on adults as well uh, in terms of attention span in terms of the way in which you seek affirmation and the diminishment of your life that actually you you are engaged with people who wouldn't know you if they passed you in the street and do they have their best interests at heart and the CAS report in particular last week highlighted just how poor the mental health is particularly for young women and what Jonathan Haidt's book really emphasizes is how women uh, particularly on platforms like Instagram or TikTok, which are way more visual, uh, that actually that's really affecting women and uh, young girls in terms body of their image? body confidence. Yeah, right. So uh, absolutely, I would applaud banning smartphones for anyone under the age of 16. I just think I cannot see any rationale for a child needing a phone. Banning smartphones or banning social media? Banning banning smartphones in general, because okay. it, it, there are all sorts of things that you can have on phones, like games. And it, it is interesting. There was some research out recently that showed that young men are less likely to have an injury than 50-year-old men. And obviously that used to be reversed because young boys would go out and climb trees and they would, mm. you know, do really physical things. But now they're just sitting at home on their phones and that's not healthy. We're, gen we're breeding a generation of people who don't have the social skills yeah. to function in adult life. Mm. And it would be, it would be affected by banning smartphones. Mm. Right. You yeah. can see with teenagers, can't you? I mean, when I'm talking to teenagers in my family, for example, they wouldn't want to pick up the phone to make a doctor's mm. appointment or they wouldn't want to ring a family member. It, it's almost been lost, isn't it? Because it's all instantaneous messaging, things like WhatsApp and... Yeah, and Snapchat, and they're obsessed Snapchat. with TikTok. And mm. I mean, I, I do think, uh, I, I'm sure we all feel that being on your smartphone is incredibly addictive. You, I know that I instinctively just reach my phone, mindlessly scroll, you get mm. lost in Twitter and you're sort of just wasting yeah. time. I mean, it does, I think we're, we're kind of all gripped by it. For sure. yeah, but it kind of goes YouTube back to the gratification hole. thing again. Uh, not all gratification this time, but just in terms of the gratification where everything is instantaneous. That actually the little sounds that are made on your phone when you get a WhatsApp message or when you get a text, that actually your brain responds to that. It's something positive and therefore you're really hungry for that. And we, we've lost the skills of actually having joy in different things. Yeah. Well, you went down a YouTube poll the other day, didn't you? You lost, what did you lose, an hour? Something like that. What were, were you little, watching? It was the little shorts. Oh, dear. You know, the little shorts where they just keep popping up and... Now, that is addictive. Got people in little shorts. That's what I was <laughs> going to say, yeah. <laughs> the, uh... <laughs> <laughs> no, the little, but it's um, little videos. He means, you, yeah, but you yeah. do end, you do end up just getting stuck on that. <laughs> I know, um, but I don't use my phone anywhere near as much as I used to. Really? So it's the man with the phone literally by him. Oh, yes, but it is also a medical device because it monitors my blood glucose, okay. which is why I have it. Uh, okay. So there you go. Oh, so yeah. you're a lot better on your phone, aren't you? Yeah, because I'm not really going on social media. You know? Have you deleted no. the apps from your phone? No, because I still post stuff on there, but. Anyways, and someone else does it. Oh, very good. So there you go. Um, He's got people. He's got people. I have people what do that for me. <laughs> <laughs> Andy, should we talk about Liz Truss's new book? I'm so glad you asked. Um, she has given interviews everywhere, I think, oh, including on... Uh, she spent longer promoting channel. the book than she did in office. She, she has. Yes, she has. She absolutely has, um, because she loves nothing more than the sound of her own voice. Uh, and oh. uh, according to so the Guardian's review, I mean, I, I should say, by the way, it's not just the Guardian who has panned this book. It's pretty much every single newspaper, including the Times yesterday. Uh, Apart from whoever serialised it. Risible, hubris, shameless, petulant and cliché ridden. Oh. Uh, yeah, I kept writing, how did you not know in the margins of chapters about her time in office? I mean, this is just, uh, I, I'm not going to read the book, by the way. I don't think I need to. I don't no, think but it's number four to. in Amazon. Oh, you don't need to read it because so many other people are buying it. I don't know whether people are going to read it, but they are buying it. And then it'll mm. be the most donated into charity shops in 2024. It I does have the ring of 99p sort of petrol station <laughs> bargain bin yeah. about it, doesn't it? I mean, one thing that I thought was remarkable about this is the... The, so, you, you know, you, you, you're commissioned to write a book, you're given an advance. 
the advance she was given for this book, I could not believe how small what? it was. Do you know? No, go on. 1,500 quid. Oh, really? Really? So, in 1993, Margaret Thatcher's advance for her memoirs was three and a, three and a half million <gasps> in yeah. 1993. Blair got 4.6 million. Liz Truss, 1,500 quid. I mean, it's, it, it's embarrassing. Well, uh, yeah, but if she, if she gets the sale, she'll make the money anyway. It's only an advance on the money sure. you would make. And, I mean, make. look, she's going to be fine for money because she's someone somewhere, for some reason, is paying her 50 grand a pop to speak about... Really? ..goodness knows what, about the disaster, the bin fire of her premiership. You're not a fan, are you, Andy? No, <laughs> I'm not. She's, a, she's, a, she's an embarrassment. She's an embarrassment. And, actually, I think more so than anything about the current government, she is the person who... When you look at polling and focus groups, it keeps coming up. Liz Truss. OK, oh. well, there you go. You may disagree. Get in touch. gbviews.com slash your say is the weather. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello, good morning. Welcome to the latest forecast from the Met Office for GB News. A chilly start in many places today, cloudier in the north with some outbreaks of rain moving in this morning, especially for northern and western Scotland, but a few light outbreaks of rain reaching Northern Ireland later in the morning. And then this area pushes into northern England and eventually North Wales by the middle of the afternoon. Turning cloudier in many places then, but staying sunny in the East Midlands, East Anglia, Southern England as well, where it will feel pleasantly warm. 15, perhaps 16 Celsius. Not feeling pleasantly warm in the northwest with the wind and the rain. And that rain tends to topple its way southwards during the evening, but it also tends to fizzle away. So not a great deal of rain reaching the south or parts of Wales even. And it will be followed by showers, blustery showers, as the wind picks up overnight. With the breeze overnight, temperatures will stay up in the mid to high single figures, so generally frost free. But it's going to be a blustery start to Friday. Areas of cloud moving south, some light showers for many places. The most frequent showers will be affecting the far north of Scotland. The wind will be feeling cold with that wind strongest along the North Sea coast and there'll be some big waves along the North Sea coast as well. Showers by the afternoon confined to the east of England. Elsewhere, brighter spells emerging, some sunshine and highs of 14 or 15 degrees. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar. Sponsors of weather on GB News. The latest GB News travel. Good morning, I'm Russell Holding on the M8 in Edinburgh. It's down to just the hard shoulder eastbound past an accident between junctions two and one from the M9 to Hermiston Gate. It's taking around 50 minutes in queues from junction three at Livingston. Buses replace trains between Kilmarnock and Stranra after a fire near the railway. On the M57 on Merseyside, there's a lane closed northbound where a vehicle caught fire between junction six at Kirby and the A59 at Switch Island, causing delays. On the M6 in Warwickshire, there's a lane closed southbound after an accident between junctions four and 3A from the M42 to the M6 toll, and it's slow there. On the M25 in Hertfordshire, the inside lanes closed anti-clockwise, where there's a breakdown just before junction 21A from the M1 South, with queues from junction 22 near St Albans. Train services are suspended between Basingstoke and Salisbury, diverting via Southampton, there's a gas leak near the railway, and relays of up to an hour to DFDS sailings between Dover and Dunkirk. That's the latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website, gbnews.com. Don't miss your chance to win our biggest prize so far. There's an incredible £10,000 in tax-free cash to spend however you like. Plus, courtesy of Variety Cruises, a bespoke seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, your next holiday could be on us. Choose any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. We'll also send you packing with these luxury travel gifts. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. 
If you want your news to be straight talking. This is the nightmare for the Conservatives again. Down to earth. It's not just Nottingham where this is happening, is it? And most importantly, honest. Hard-working, middle-class taxpayers, they'll get their book thrown at them. Then catch me, Martin Daubney, Monday to Friday, 3 to 6 p.m. on GB News, Britain's news channel. Every Saturday, 10 till 12, we'll bring you all of the news that you need to know. We'll also remind you that there is so much to smile about. It's my favourite time of the week. I get to relax, enjoy some lighthearted stories and let Ellie teach me about fashion too. <laughs> That's Saturday Morning Live, every Saturday, 10 till 12. Only on GB News, Britain's news channel. Join me, Neil Oliver, every Sunday night at 6pm on GB News. And if an hour is not nearly enough for you, go to gbnews.com for special extended episodes online every Friday at 9pm, where we can truly get into the nitty gritty of what's going on. GB News, Britain's news channel. Good morning to you. It's 8 o'clock, Thursday the 18th of April. Today, another scandal hits the Tory party as the MP Mark Menzies loses the whip over claims he misused campaign funds. A bizarre story with all sorts of twists and turns and another big headache for Rishi Sunak. What will happen next? Find out more with me very soon. 70 asylum seekers are moved out of an ex-RAF base after major safety risks emerge. 70 residents of former RAF Weathers Weathersfield are now back in expensive hotels over fears of contamination and unexploded ordnance. I'll have the details. The Prince of Wales will return to official public duties today for the first time since the Princess of Wales revealed her cancer diagnosis. After three and a half weeks of looking after his wife and children, Prince William is visiting a charity that distributes leftover food to communities who need it. More details shortly. Time for a boost to defence spending. While the Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, admits that European countries must step up, we'll be speaking to the Defence Secretary, Grant Shapps, later this hour. The travel carnage in Dubai, flash flooding devastates the city. We spoke to a British expat this morning. Unfortunately, um, some people ha are still stuck in their properties. Some people's homes have been flooded. It really has been a, a very scary time for us all here. And in the sport this morning, the Champions League is now Premier League less after Manchester City and Arsenal both go out. Emma Raducanu's on a roll. She's beaten the former world number one. And also, we're on the catwalk with more Olympic fashions. It's a beautiful start out there for many places and there's more sunshine to come this weekend. But before that happens, there is some rain to talk about in the forecast coming up shortly. Morning to you. I'm Stephen Dixon. And I'm Ellie Costello and this is Breakfast on GB News. Um, we talk about banning things mm. uh, because obviously smoking's being banned or phased out, and we've talked about alcohol this morning. Should, well, you know, should it apply to alcohol? Phones apparently for teenagers, which I don't necessarily disagree with. After so, I think there is a problem there. Um, but it's, you're not happy. Daryl and Jody Singleton say ban this, ban that, stop dictating how we live our lives. I think that's a. a, a I mean, it's a fair point. We, as, as much as some things need to be controlled to an extent, I don't think we should just be banning everything. Um, and Utha says, ban getting up in the mornings. If you stay in bed, you're a lot safer. Yeah, well. Yeah, well, there you go. I think, so. I think that's probably a fairly, a fairly good point, actually. Uh, and there were some lovely messages about how smart we look this morning, but I can't find them now. So oh, thank you, you to whoever said that we looked smart this morning. We are making an effort to try and coordinate. Thank you. Uh, somebody said that we'd be very good wedding guests in today's Oh, outfits. professional wedding guests, That was it. Said. Professional if... wedding. Oh, you saw that one as well, did I you? I saw that I can't one. Find it now. There's if, so many of them. If we lose our jobs here, which, frankly, is looking likely, <laughs> um, I should imagine by our performance. Um, well, yes. That we, that we should set up as professional wedding guests. Yeah. How much would you pay to have us come to your wedding? Let us know. Yep. Might be might be a very good opportunity for could us. Could be a sideline, that, line, that yeah, couldn't it? could be a little side hustle. You know, I'd be up for that love a wedding. Just turn up, eat the food and smile at people. I yeah. don't know. You like a wedding as well, don't you? Well, I would be if I was getting paid to go. You'd be up for it, yeah. 
Um, we're just talking about expensive coffee. Apparently, the most expensive co um, coffee in the world is Australia and New Zealand. Really? So Steve, yep. Uh, coffee in the UK is just poor quality. But it's actually yeah. more expensive in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, well, not more expensive than that one that has arrived in Mayfair now, mm. which is £265 a shot. Yes, imagine ordering a double espresso <laughs> and milk. That'll be £530, please. Yeah, plus, plus your if milk you're... and sugar, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, why, why get free milk? My goodness. I mean, can you imagine? It's what I can't understand. I'm all for, if people, I'm all for people having loads of money. If they earn it or win it or whatever, fine, fair enough. But why would you spend that much on coffee? It's more money than cents, isn't it? Coffee's expensive enough. Yes. Isn't it? I saw somewhere in London oh. the other day, actually, sorry. Here we the go. The Albanian co uh, cafe, and they were doing coffee for £1.50. I thought, that is incredible. Oh, there you go. But it is just hot water. Well, and, and coffee beans. a little beans. bit coffee beans, but they're making a great profit on that. Yeah, there you go. Anyway, keep your views coming in on that story, or indeed anything that we're talking about this morning, or just tell us where you are and what you're up to. gbnews.com slash your say. Now, uh, our main news this morning, and there's another scandal hitting the Tory party. MP Mark Menzies has lost the party whip over the alleged misuse of campaign funds. Yes, Number 10 have launched an investigation into the matter. Menzies is now no longer a member of the Tory party and will sit as an independent MP in the House of Commons. Well, he issued a statement saying, I dispute allegations put to me. We'll go through those in a moment. I fully complied with all the rules for declarations. As there's an investigation ongoing, I will not comment further. But it is a complex issue, this it one. It certainly is. And to unpack it all for us is political correspondent Olivia Utley, who's live for us now in Westminster. Very good morning to you, Olivia. So another scandal to hit the Tory party, and it's a real headache for Rishi Sunak. Well, absolutely. If this investigation proves that Mark Menzies did what he uh, is alleged to have done, then it will be a huge scandal for the Conservative Party. I should say straight away, he does dispute all of the allegations. Essentially, what he's been accused of is uh, taking £14,000 of money donated for a conser his Conservative Party campaign and using it for his own purposes. In part, it seems, to pay some private medical bills. He's also accused, this very, very strange story, of calling his former campaign manager, a 78-year-old Old woman at three o'clock in the morning and demanding that she transfer him five thousand pounds from the campaign account into his own personal account because he said he was being held by bad people and needed to pay them five thousand pounds to be released. This lady would not uh, uh, transfer the money at three o'clock in the morning. So later in the day, uh, Mark Menzies rang his current campaign manager, a woman called Shirley Green, and asked that she transfer that £6,500. He eventually got the money, but various uh, Tory volunteers had to use their own personal funds, apparently, uh, to, to help him out with this claim. Obviously, if he is found to be guilty of this, then it will be construed as fraud. The problem for Rishi Sunak is that the Conservative Party didn't seem to take it very seriously at first. These allegations first emerged three months ago, and we're only just hearing about it now. OK. OK. Olivia, for now, thanks very much indeed. Well, the Conservative Party have issued a statement saying they're investigating allegations made regarding a Member of Parliament. It's confidential. The party takes all allegations seriously and will always investigate any matters put to them. Now, the Home Office has been forced to move asylum seekers out of an ex-RAF base in Essex after safety concerns were raised about the site. Well, let's talk to our reporter, Ray Addison, who's there for us. So what's the problem with the site, Ray? Morning to you both. Yes, well, this site was assessed as safe and fit for purpose. Ten months ago, asylum seekers started moving in here, but now we have these major safety concerns. Safety risks have reportedly been identified, including the possibility of radiation on the site and also unexploded ordnance. What's ordnance? It's artillery shells and things like that. A lot of things uh, that we certainly wouldn't want to suddenly go bang. Now, this 
site is one of the Home Office's largest asylum seeker accommodation locations. It has a maximum of 800. Originally, the plan was to have 1,700 here, uh, but they decided to reduce that figure. Um, and actually, it's getting quite busy. The longer I stay here today, I can see it's quite a busy site, a uh, number of vehicles coming and going, plenty of security guards uh, as well. But so far, no signs of anything um, more concerning than that hazmat suits and the like, although maybe that is just a matter of time. Last month, though, they got planning permission to use this location for three years. They were granted a special development order, uh, an SDO, in order to circumvent council planning permission. And there were concerns raised in that SDO uh, about the risk of contamination. And it does appear that some of those risks have now been realised, uh, necessitating at least 70 uh, having been moved back into these expensive hotels. Now, earlier on, um, I got the chance to uh, shout a few words at a couple of the uh, residents here uh, as they went on their journey. This is what they had to say. Another quick chat. No? no Are you guys worried about the contamination on the site? Where are you off to? Yeah. Where are you going? Walking. Oh, where, what, what job do you have? Well, Braintree District Council uh, were offered the chance to have an interview. They declined that, but they've given me a statement. They said they've written to the Home Office requesting urgent copies of all the relevant technical documents and plans under that SDO to support our duty in safeguarding the interests of the local community and those living and working on the site. OK, Ray Addison, thank you very much indeed. Well, the Home Office has responded, saying, we've always been clear the use of asylum hotels is unacceptable, which is why we moved asylum seekers to former military sites, which we ensure are safe to accommodate asylum seekers prior to use. If they're being moved out... Oh, well, it's not safe, is it? Well, it can't be, can it? Otherwise, why are you moving them out? Mm. Anyway. Interesting. Now, Prince William is to return to official public duties today for the first time since the Princess of Wales re revealed her cancer diagnosis. Yeah, he's going to visit a surplus food distribution charity, followed by a youth centre in London, which benefits from the organisation's deliveries. Well, we're joined now by our royal correspondent, Cameron Walker. Good to see you this morning, Cameron. And it's going to be really good to see Prince William today, isn't it? Y yes, it certainly is. We haven't seen him for more than three and a half weeks, actually. His children, George, Charlotte and Louis, were back at school yesterday. Of course, this is the first time we're going to see him since the Princess of Wales, as you said, uh, disclosed her cancer diagnosis to the world. So he's taking after his father a bit. King Charles launched the Coronation Food Project to support charities feeding disadvantaged communities back in November. Prince William doing something slightly different. He's visiting a surplus food distribution charity called Surplus to Supper in Surrey, uh, which distributes over 10 tonnes of food per week, waste, wasted food, to food banks, uh, schools, care homes, religious organisations and youth centres. So he's going to be volunteering there, packaging up the food, and then he's going to be taking it to a youth centre in West London. Now, Kensington Palace says that re reducing food waste has a considerable number of environmental benefits, including reducing emissions from landfill that contribute to climate change. It also added that protecting the environments for future generations if one, is one of Prince William's key priorities. Of course, he launched his Earthshot Prize in 2020. One of the categories in that is build a waste-free world. Yeah, but, you know, and well, all well and good is doing something today that he believes in and fine, can get the message across. But for most of us, we're just going to be saying, well, he's back on his feet. He's, you know, he's, he's getting on with, with the job. After what must have been... I mean, obviously, our hearts go out to Catherine. But, it, I mean, it must be an incredibly stressful time for him. It certainly is, and I think there's been a huge burden placed on Prince William. Even before the princess revealed her cancer diagnosis, the speculation around herself and her family was vast, and Prince William had to pull out of that uh, memorial service for his godfather, King Constantine uh, of Greece. The reason, I understand, is because of Kate's cancer diagnosis. So it has been a really uh, difficult time for him because he has had to balance his royal duties 
with his private family as well. And there's been huge pressure for Prince William, I think, perhaps to do more public engagements. I think post Kate's cancer diagnosis, I think the British public and the media and social media trolls did take a step back and give the princess, the prince and her, uh, their children the privacy they needed to come to terms with that cancer diagnosis. But this is Prince William keeping calm and carrying on and getting on with the job, I think, now post Easter break. OK. Yeah. Cameron, thanks very much indeed. Now, there's been chaos in the United Arab Emirates as thousands of UK travellers are now struggling to get home after Dubai International Airport was closed due to flash flooding. Well, the airport urged passengers to stay away unless absolutely necessary after it was hit um, with more than a year's worth of rainfall in just 24 hours. Well, one man has tragically lost his life as a result of the bad weather. Earlier, we spoke to one British expat. Fortunately, um, some people ha are still stuck in their properties. Some people's homes have been flooded. It really has been a, a very scary time for us all here. Well, let's talk to weather journalist Nathan Rao, who joins us now. Nathan, there's been all this talk mm. about um, cloud seeding, which may have caused some of this. Just tell us what's going on. Right. Yes. I mean, first of all, this is this is an unprecedented amount of rain that they've had in the United Arab, Arab Emirates, um, which is, a, of course, a desert. Um, now, cloud seeding has been suggested as a possible cause for this deluge. There is some dispute. But cloud seeding is a type of weather modification that's used to artificially trigger rain in places where they don't get a lot. Um, rain forms within clouds on tiny, tiny particles called nuclei. That is what a rain droplet is. And uh, these can be salt particles or dust particles. And in places where they don't get a lot of rain, like Dubai, like the United Arab Emirates, they go up in planes and they seed these clouds, usually with silver iodide, to form these particles and to encourage the rain to fall. Um, and this is used in places where drought is a problem or to encourage places where irrigation is a problem. The, the issue that we have is Dubai is a desert and its infrastructure is not used to this amount of rainfall. As you mentioned, they've had actually a year and a half amount of rain in less than a week and the infrastructure can't cope with it. So there is a dispute now going on about whether this was simply a usual low pressure system. There was, after all, a storm forecast in the area. A storm was seen coming in. But there was also sightings of cloud seeding drones, cloud seeding planes around the area in the run up to the week, which is being suggested as a cause for this. But there is some dispute over that. I mean, there is an understanding, though, isn't there, that this is unprecedented. This will go down in history. Do you think yeah. that Dubai should be preparing itself for this to happen again, or do you think this is a, a one-off event? Well, my, my stance is if it's happened once, it can always happen again. Um, if we look at the, the causes of this rain, as we've suggested, there's, there's, there's been suggestions about cloud seeding. There's also been suggestions it's a normal weather event. But we also get into the, the debate again about the changing climate around the world. And are countries all around the world going to start experiencing weather phenomenon that they don't usually get? This, I can be very confident in saying, is a weather phenomenon that Dubai or the United Emirates do not usually get. Dubai usually gets around three inches of rain a year. They rely on their water through uh, seawater desalination and groundwater supplies. Rain is very, very infrequent in Dubai. And this is absolutely unprecedented. So should they prepare for more of this to come? Well, I think the, the chaos that we're seeing at the moment, which reveals that they simply are unprepared for rainfall like this, may suggest that it wouldn't be a bad idea to become prepared for it. But it's, again, that balance of how much rain does Dubai get in a year, only about three inches, um, at whether the cost it would cause you know, involve to restructure the infrastructure, deal with rain like we have in the UK, where we get loads of it. OK, Nathan Rao, good to see you this morning. Thank you very much indeed. Mm. Yeah, well, I mean, it's a worry, the amount that's gone down there. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> just, just a quickie, yeah. just, just in case the bosses are listening yeah. at the moment or watching. Uh, Jean has been in touch, says, Stephen, don't joke about losing your job. GB News would lose viewers if that happened. There you go. So Don't I'm get just, any ideas. I'm just saying He's that, here to stay. I'm just saying that loud and clear. <laughs> Good news here. We're, we're going to be here all weekend, aren't we, darling? All weekend, yes. So you don't have to miss a thing over Friday, the next Friday, Saturday, four days. Sunday. <laughs> yeah, perfect.
Perfect. We'll have a good time, hopefully. It is. Uh, right, shall we see what the weather's going to do over here? Here's Aidan. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello, good morning. Welcome to the latest forecast from the Met Office for GB News. A chilly start in many places today, cloudier in the north with some outbreaks of rain moving in this morning, especially for northern and western Scotland. But a few light outbreaks of rain reaching Northern Ireland later in the morning. And then this area pushes into northern England and eventually North Wales by the middle of the afternoon. Turning cloudier in many places then, but staying sunny in the East Midlands, East Anglia, Southern England as well, where it will feel pleasantly warm. 15, perhaps 16 Celsius. Not feeling pleasantly warm in the northwest with the wind and the rain. And that rain tends to topple its way southwards during the evening, but it also tends to fizzle away. So not a great deal of rain reaching the south or parts of Wales even. And it will be followed by showers, blustery showers, as the wind picks up overnight. With the breeze overnight, temperatures will stay up in the mid to high single figures, so generally frost free. But it's going to be a blustery start to Friday. Areas of cloud moving south, some light showers for many places. The most frequent showers will be affecting the far north of Scotland. The wind will be feeling cold with that wind strongest along the North Sea coast and there'll be some big waves along the North Sea coast as well. Showers by the afternoon confined to the east of England. Elsewhere, brighter spells emerging, some sunshine and highs of 14 or 15 degrees. A brighter outlook with Box Solar. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Now, there's still plenty of time to grab your chance to win a Greek cruise for two, travel goodies and £10,000 tax-free cash bank balance boost. Yes, here's all the details you need. Don't miss your chance to win our biggest prize so far. There's an incredible £10,000 in tax-free cash to spend however you like. Plus, courtesy of Variety Cruises, a bespoke seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, your next holiday could be on us. Choose any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. We'll also send you packing with these luxury travel gifts. Gifts. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text WIN to 63232. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04, PO Box 8690, Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash WIN. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. <laughs> you like that music, do you? Yeah, I love the Greek you music. You do know we're back on the television Yes, now. we're back on the television. Um, You're such a natural mover. Thank you. You're a natural mover. Don't take the mickey out. <laughs> Can you dance? I've never no, actually... No. Uh, not for love nor money. Oh. I've never actually been to a party with you. Well, I did invite you to my 30th. You didn't come, did you? No, I didn't go. Yeah. Where was I? I don't know. Oh, I had, oh, better, clearly. I had yeah, my cousin was getting married that weekend. Oh, well, I might forgive you then. So I had to go. You are invited to my wedding, though. Thank you very much indeed. Will you be coming to that one, or will you have a better I, I better think, invite elsewhere? I think we're busy. Yeah, I think we're busy. We'll see. No, we'll be there. We've already taken the book the time off. Have you? Well, oh, no, I'm very impressed. It, it's, it's, it's miles away, but you know. It's a long way away, yeah. But yes, we will be there. Don't pack your suitcase just yet. Celebrating, pushing her down the aisle. When you pushing. I'll be right Down there. Yeah. Ready to... Oh, well, that's nice. That's right. Yeah, romantic. Anyway, look, how we go from that to uh, to Grant Shapps, I, do, uh, I don't, don't know. know. But then we're going to be You're talking... You're going to try. We're going to be talking to the Defence Secretary in a few minutes, and we're going to have Paul with all your sport as well. And that's coming up after the break. Free Speech Nation. Sunday nights from 7pm. So, J. Cole, who is a rapper, says that he felt terrible after releasing a song aimed at fellow rapper Kendrick Lamar and vowed to pull the track off streaming services. He said, I ain't gonna lie to y'all. Uh, the past two days felt terrible, he told an audience at the uh, Dreamville Festival in North Carolina. I damn near had a relapse, he said.
there's a lot of young people, especially, you know, that would look at that and they will take it not just as entertainment. It doesn't happen in any other form of art that I can think of. This is not happening in country music, is it? Can't well, it's the, same, it's the same problem in both cases, isn't it? Who's doing the regulating? And surely it's each case on its merits, isn't it? It's, you don't just ban a genre. Why is there such a lot of hatred for a man who usually would have trash-talked back mm. to stand up and say, you know, this doesn't sit well with me and I love this guy? If we look at... I think his name was Cody Fisher, the semi-professional footballer who died in a club yeah. because someone stabbed him. Yeah. Now, he was stabbed because he stepped on someone's trainers. This is the level of ego we're seeing from a lot of young men who don't have any output <laughs> of being able to channel that energy, and a lot of it is stemming from cultures like football, hip-hop, these sorts of things. So I'm just saying it's refreshing to see yeah. a man yeah. who could have easily wiped the floor with his lyrics say, I don't have to. You know? That is interesting, isn't it? Because I almost I took this interview in the wrong direction. It's not about pointing out the areas of concern. Actually, this story is saying, look, music Balance. and art can be giving you an example of how to live a slightly better That's life. That's free speech. Saying, yeah. sorry. Oh. I'm, I'm sorry I choose not to fight back because I love you. It may look like a wimpy thing to do, but it's still you free speech. You know what? I, agree. I love you, Paul. Sorry about earlier. <laughs> <laughs> Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Time for the small this morning with Mr. Paul Coit. Good morning to you, sir. Good morning to you. The Champions League champions are out of the Champions League. Oh. Manchester City. Three all it was in that first leg over in Madrid. Came back to the Etihad and you're thinking, this, you know, th this is where they want to do. They want to play at home for the second leg. And uh, Real Madrid scored early. It was a real fight. Man City just kept kept at them. You know, it was like wave after wave, but managed to get a goal, 76th minute with Kevin De Bruyne, then it went into extra time, went to penalties. Unfortunately, it went the way of Real Madrid. And ah. that's, that's the way it goes. That's, that's... Well, it is, the way, it is the way it goes. Disappointing, though. And, and, and bad news for Arsenal as well. Bad news for Arsenal as well. Um, Arsenal are out to buy Munich. So I wonder whether so you've got Harry Kane and Eric Dyer, both ex <clears throat> Hotspur players, yeah. that played for Bayern Munich. And they probably quite enjoyed that. They yeah. would have enjoyed it, probably mm. even more so. But the most important thing is that Bayern Munich have been pretty poor this year. I mean, Harry Kane's had a brilliant season, but as far as... As Ellie goes, the Bundesliga mm -hmm. is concerned. It hasn't been very good because who won the title this year? Uh, by a Leverkusen. By a Leverkusen, who were known as... By, by Neverkusen. Neverkusen. By Neverkusen, but now they have, so they won the title. By Munich have now I got the like Champions League. I feel like we're in a class and we just repeat it answers to you. By a Leverkusen's manager who's been tipped for taking over at Liverpool. Yes, Xabi Alonso. That's correct. But he said that he wants to stay at Bayer Leverkusen. So, or, so, but I wonder, I just wonder, you know, when Liverpool, where he played, come knocking, it's the same as Bayern Munich. He played for Bayern Munich as well. Oh. Um, they're both looking for managers in the summer. So it's going to take a lot for him to be able to go, actually, you know what, I'm going to stay where I am because he's performed miracles there. Yeah. So we'll see how things go. I did um, say four goals. I don't know where that came from, but it's only three. It's only three that Liverpool have got to get back against Atalanta oh. tonight. So um, three goal deficit. So it's a three goal deficit over in it uh, over in Italy. It's it's very possible. They've done it before against Real Madrid and Liverpool are a great side. They sh 
I mean, got to be, they've got to be hungry for that. And, Early um, goal, you never know how it goes. It's the same as West Ham. They're playing at home to Bayer Leverkusen, um, who are unbeaten all season, so they're 2-0 down. They need to beat them, and also then it all affects the coefficient, and we'll, we'll leave mm. the coefficient for now. Uh, and anyway, Aston Villa, uh, they go away uh, to France. They're playing in Lille, and they are 2-1 uh, down, I should say, in the conference. Oh. It's all very confusing. Yeah, but it's also... We're, you know, we're not looking strong, are we? We're not. As no, a country, is, you know it. what? It is a bit of a worry. I don't think we've always got teams either in the final or semi-final and nobody is certain of, um, of moving on. Mm. So, oh. so it is a bit of a worry. Should we do some... Tennis with good news. I've got some good news for you. Emma Raducanu oh. looks like she's back. Right. People have been knocking. They We've have knocked her a lot. There's been Radakan who knock us for a long time, and we are not going to stand for it because I believe in her. So yeah. Emma Radakanu, she beat Angelique Kerber, former world number one in the Stuttgart Open, 6-1, 6-2. She did very well. Uh, third win in a week, so who knows? Maybe um, she's coming back. Do you want to do some fashion? No. We are out of time, I'm afraid. Am I going to have to quite. save this for tomorrow? Yes, you, you are. are. OK, more Olympic fashion I have for you tomorrow. Yeah, because I don't want to lose it. You can only have too much of a good thing. Yeah. See you tomorrow. <laughs> there you go, Paul. Thank you. Uh, coming up, we're going to be talking to the Defence Secretary, Grant Shapps. The latest GB News travel. Good morning, I'm Russell Holding. On the M8 in Edinburgh, it's down to just the hard shoulder eastbound after an accident between junctions 2 and 1 from the M9 to Hermiston Gate. It's taking around an hour in queues from junction 3 at Livingston. The delays 2 back on the M9 towards there. On the M56 in Cheshire, the inside lanes close to eastbound between junctions 14 and 12 towards Runcorn. For emergency repairs to damage Corsman and Lorry caught fire yesterday evening, causing queues. On the A48M in Cardiff, it's down to a single lane southbound for repairs at St Melons after an accident earlier in Somerset the A361 is closed each way between Dean and Leighton after an accident yesterday evening train services between Andover and Salisbury are diverting via Southampton because of a gas leak and there are delays of up to an hour to DFDS sailings between Dover and Dunkirk after a passenger was taken ill earlier and that's the latest you can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website gbnews.com GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other, which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Neil Oliver, every Sunday night at 6pm on GB News. And if an hour is not nearly enough for you, go to gbnews.com for special extended episodes online every Friday at 9pm, where we can truly get into the nitty gritty of what's going on. GB News, Britain's news channel. Good morning. It is 8.33 in this election year on your election channel. Everything's, everything is highlighted by the election. Mm. And, of course, that means looking at polls, not polls just about who's leading, but also about in what areas are parties trusted. 
Let's talk to the Defence Secretary, Grant Shapps, who joins us now. Really good to see you this morning, Minister. Can I, you'll have seen this big spread in the, in the mail today. And one of the key points in this is that defence, according to this survey, um, the general public think defence is better left in hands of the Labour Party than the Conservative Party. Now, that is quite something. You are normally the party trusted on defence. What is going wrong? I, I think that's in the context of the wider polling. I, I saw that poll, which also says, of course, that 45 per cent of people don't want to see Starmer as prime minister. So you can you can take it any way you like. On defence particularly, I would say, to point out the obvious, Keir Starmer supported twice uh, Jeremy Corbyn, who wanted to pull us out of NATO and abandon uh, our nuclear defence. Um, so I, I don't think that it is the case that Labour could or could be trusted on defence, not least because they have 11 members of his shadow team who themselves voted against our nuclear deterrent. So I don't think they are credible when it comes to being the party of defence. No, it, it is the backdrop to this, not that, you know, we know the armed forces are struggling, we know numbers are down, we know equipment isn't available to uh, a lot of these soldiers. I mean, particularly, you've got to look at the number of tanks we've got where people are, you know, they're really struggling to get hold of tanks, a lot of the household divisions and what have you. I mean, this, this is... It's hugely problematic, and what we're not seeing is anything improving under the government. I, I, I have to sort of take some issue with this, actually, because, uh, apart from anything, I'm going to see our Challenger 3 tank later today uh, up in uh, Telford, uh, which is our latest and will be the best tank, one of the best tanks in the, in the world. We're also spending more on defence in cash terms than we've ever spent and increased the spending um, this year. Uh, we are one of only two countries in the world who actually go out and use our defensive you know, ability, for example, against the Houthis, or even on Saturday night, where the fantastic RAF were defending Israel from those incoming uh, missiles and attacks from drones. So we, we are prepared to use our armed forces. And of course, it's the second biggest one in NATO. So we are, we are not small or, or minnows in this. Of course, we can always do more. I'm Defence Secretary. I want us to do more. We're pledged to get to 2.5% when conditions allow, and I want to get to that point. But uh, I think to, to claim that Labour are somehow the party of defence when their own shadow foreign secretary voted against Trident and their own deputy prime minister, Angela Rayner, voted against Trident is uh, somewhat ridiculous. We don't think that they can be trusted on defence. Of course, it's my job to demonstrate that point. I mean, on the topic of, of spending in defence, the Treasury confirmed there'd be no increase in defence spending uh, before the general election. I mean, you must be so disappointed by that answer, considering the, the threats that we're seeing from Russia, China and Iran, and, as you say, the events of, of Saturday night. What I think is really important is the kind of direction of travel. And we have already said, and the Prime Minister has repeated, and Chancellor as well, we want to get to the 2.5%. We'll do it when conditions allow us to, to do it. But in the meantime, I think it's probably important to understand we have actually, even at this last budget, a 1.8% real terms increase in our defence budget. So I'm Defence Secretary. Of course I want to see more money uh, in whatever sector of state you are, whichever position I've been in in the past, whether it's been in transport or in energy or, or several others, I've always fought for, and I have to say, one budgets for those areas. But the important thing is, we do care about the defence of the realm. We understand it's the first task of any government, and we have an armed forces uh, well-equipped that we can be proud of in this country. And the proof of the pudding is, we are the ones going out and defending freedom of navigation at sea, in the Red Sea, helping Israel in its own defence on Saturday night, and many other examples like that, where we are Ukraine. I mean, no country, as President Zelensky has said to me directly, no country has stepped up, done more, been prepared to give more uh, in terms of its leadership, as well as the biggest package ever this year that Rishi Sunak and myself have given to Ukraine, bigger than was given under even Boris Johnson. So, you know, no one should doubt how much we're stepping up to help defend in this world in British interests.
Yeah, what about the, what about defending the UK in all of this? And it's a valid point that people raise, isn't it? Because we are providing an awful lot to places like Ukraine. Um, we are supporting in the defence of Israel, uh, certainly you know, to a, to an extent. I know that's you know, a controversial issue in, in and of itself for some people. Um, but what about the threat here in the UK and, and how? capable we are actually of defending ourselves because that seems to be the one part which is you know a, a little bit lacking at the moment well some of that is because uh, in part we don't um advertise uh the reasons of national security all our layers of defense some are known about for example the quick hit, quick reaction uh, that we have through the typhoons constantly available and ready to scramble uh, but we also have other forms of defense as well missiles and other things which i can't go into uh, of course we're always wanting always reviewing this i keep a very close eye on what else we could be doing the big difference between say the united kingdom and israel that was recently attacked is the uk is in nato and article 5 of nato says that if one country is attacked then the 31 others all immediately come to its assistance. And it's one of the reasons the NATO countries don't tend to be attacked. In fact, they've never attacked uh, because of this. So uh, it does mean that there we have a, an additional layer of protection, even over and above the immediate physically obvious protection. Uh, uh, but always keep that under review, always looking to do more. Um, but Britain is a, a force for good when it comes to uh, not only our national defence, the jobs that brings, but also international defence. Uh, and I think we should be very proud of our service personnel who do a phenomenal job. I think last year we operated, if I'm correct, in 69 different countries around the world. The scale of this is perhaps something that most people are not familiar with. Uh, on the situation between Israel and Iran, your colleague Lord Cameron has met with Benjamin Netanyahu, who's made it clear that Israel are going to make their own decisions in terms of uh, retaliation. What's your understanding of what Israel's response will look like? And are you concerned about what this tit for tat uh, will eventually lead to, considering the front page of the eye this morning, uh, the advancement of the Iranian nuclear program in the past few years? I think mean, Iran has been worrying us for years, and the, the uh, nuclear program, uh, we know that uh, the last report out was 83.7% enriched uranium. That's incredibly, there's no civil use for that. That's only for a military potential use. And we've just seen what Iran's done. They've just attacked a democratic country in the Middle East. Iran themselves are autocratic or theocratic country who say they want to destroy that country. So I don't think there's any doubt at all. Iran is bad news. They sponsor uh, all the three H's, the Hamas, the Houthis, and of course Hezbollah uh, in the Middle East, they're bad news. It is, of course, absolutely wrong that Israel was attacked. That's why we took part in the defense of Israel on Saturday night. What we've been saying to Israel is we have to be careful here not to get into a spiral that simply leads to a further regional conflict or something even bigger. And it's important to therefore ensure that the response, which we absolutely accept Israel is going to make, we understand that, uh, but that it is a response that is intelligent and well thought through. And that is the point we've been making. And I think that Israel uh, is uh, perfectly within her rights to defend herself. If that was the UK attacked by 300 drones, ballistic cruise missiles on Saturday nights, even expecting us to respond as well. Um if we, can, can we broaden it out a little bit? I mean, we, we all understand how politics works, to an extent, at least. And, you've, you know, you've got to get on with your job. You've got a job to do. <clears throat> you've got to get on with it. You've got a plan for what you will do w when you win the next election, from your perspective. We totally get that. But when you look at all the polling, when you look at the fact there's been another scandal with Mark Menzies losing and having to lose the party whip and all that going on, uh, over the last day or so. How do you even begin to deal with that? Because it, everybody expects now, everyone with any political nouns, nous is expecting there to be a Labour government whenever that election is called. How do you even put forward an argument to try to counter that? No, first of all, I, 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 yeah, I get on my job as Defence Secretary, defending the realm, making sure this country's safe. 
you're right, the politics all continues as well. I, I'd say this, I think most people recognize that we have been through extraordinary difficult times. We've had the COVID pandemic, we've had this war in Europe, we've now got this conflict in the Middle East. All of this stuff has a big impact, not least on the economy. But we've got a prime minister in Rishi Sunak who has gone out, done the right thing, saved millions of jobs during the pandemic, is very good at making difficult uh, decisions, for example, on the Northern Ireland situation in order to get that resolved. Uh, and actually, uh, they'll look at him and they'll look at the alternative, Keir Starmer, who, you know, just last night ordered his lords, his peers in the House of Lords, to vote again against the Rwanda scheme. And in doing so, has tried to shoot down legislation, which is, as far as I can work out, the only solution out there to stop the trade in people, the human trafficking, the gangs bringing people across the channel. And I don't hear any alternative from that. In fact, I think I think Keir Starmer's terrified that the Rwanda scheme would somehow work, uh, and uh, you know I I don't understand what his alternative is. Easy to snipe from the sidelines. Being in politics long enough to know, and I was party chairman once for, for David Cameron in the run up to the 2015 election, where I'd sit on shows like this, and sometimes they put graphics up behind me to demonstrate it was impossible for us to get an overall majority in 2015. Of course, we know now through history that's exactly what happened. So. You look, for all the pundits, for all the commentators who say this is all over, I would say don't, uh, don't, don't second guess the British public. People actually have their say over it because that same poll you were you know, quoting from at the top of the programme uh, about what people think also says that 45% of people do not want to see Keir Starmer prime minister. So I think that we are still in absolutely with the shot, except we're the underdogs. I accept that. But I think we have a better programme on defence, on job creation and everything else than the Labour Party. And when it comes to actually stopping the, the boats, they don't even have a plan for the Labour Party, and they keep voting against it 119 times in counting, up until and including last night in the House of Lords. And I think people start to realise Labour are not the solution. And they'll look again at us and realise we've taken some difficult decisions. But get everything right. We are trying our best, and I think we're better news for the future of this country than Labour. OK, just before we let you go, I wanted to ask you about RAF Weathersfield in Essex. It's an ex-RAF uh, base. Asylum seekers have been moved out of there after safety risks uh, were found, including radiological contamination and unexploded ordnance. I mean, do you have any understanding of, of what has happened there? Because it doesn't look good, does it? We've got the likes of, of Bibby Stockholm, which uh, wasn't safe for asylum seekers, and now RAF Withersfield. I mean, it, it looks as though accommodation for asylum seekers isn't fit for purpose. But first of all, I should just top it by saying one of the reasons we want to stop this illegal trade in people crossing the channel, and the Rwanda Bill is a very important part of that, is to prevent us from needing accommodation in the first place. So, I mean, that's the first thing to say. Secondly, although it's got RAF in front of it, that's actually a, a home office um, site. They've obviously found a health and safety issue there. I'm not familiar with the details. I've just seen this this morning. Uh, but they've obviously found a health and safety issue. It looks to me like they've acted very quickly uh, and moved people out of there whilst they take care of that. But it brings me back to the, the point before. Let's stop the illegal trade in people. Let's pass this Rwanda bill. Let's stop messing around, as Keir Starmer was telling his lords to do last night, by chucking this out again, so the Commons is going to have to go and come back and vote on it. We've already voted for it numerous times. Uh, and let's actually break this illegal chain of people being brought here, and then we won't need this accommodation in the first place. Grant Chaps, as always, good to see you. Thank you for your time it's today. Thank you very much indeed. Do let us know what you think about anything uh, that Grant Chaps was saying there. gbnews.com slash your say. Right, we're going to take a short break. Back with the papers in just a moment. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday.
I wonder, is this the fundamental distinction we need to make between Islam, which is a, a, a private religion, people may practice freely uh, amongst themselves, and Islamism? When you try and place those values upon other people, place that, that way of being, force it on people who don't want it. I have been very much clear about this thing that Islam is a religion and people are free to follow that religion in the UK, in a Western, free Western society. So we, we have no problem with people following their religion as long as it is not being imposed mm. onto the wider society and when you would uh, you talk about uh, drawing a distinction between islam and islamism people like me you and me we are drawing that distinction we're trying to maintain that distinction but if you uh, look at the commentator from the muslim community some commentator they would like to blur this line and they would ask you what is islamism where does it exist sorry it does exist mm. we see it and the teacher this incident is an epitome of that kind of, you know, ideology being prevalent, you know, in, in our Khadija, society. Khadija, do you worry so, that there are, that these views are typical for some sections of society? Do you think that there's a problem with some Muslim men that they have perhaps uh, views that we don't consider to be British values? There are certain readings of religion which are misogynistic, which are discriminatory, which are homophobic. We need to be honest about it. We need to be calling it out whenever we hear these kind of views. It's been a long time that we are letting these kind of ideologies crawling in, you know, um, spreading tentacles in British society, and we are just ignoring it in the name of respecting people's culture and mm. religion. You are not suppressing the UK. I'm Patrick Christie's. Every weeknight from nine, I bring you two hours of unmissable, explosive debate and headline-grabbing interviews. What impact has that had? We got death threats and the bomb threat and so on. Our job is to do what's in the best interest of our country. You made my argument for me. My guests and I tackle the issues that really matter with a sharp take on every story. I'm hearing it up and down the country. That was a beginning, not an end. Patrick Christie's tonight from 9 p.m. only on GB News, Britain's news channel. Well, we're going to have a quick whip through the papers with political commentator Andy Williams and psychotherapist Lucy Beresford. Good morning to you both. Good morning. morning. Let's talk relationships, Lucy. Yes. Uh, yes, in South Korea, uh, women are actually foregoing sex, dating, marriage and children. Why? And those four words begin with the letter B, so they're known as the 4B generation. Well, I think what this speaks to is the general fluidity of relationships. There was this fantastic research from Ashley Madison recently, which is the married dating website, yes. and they found that their, the number of people who are signing up most for that site are not married people at all. They are under 29, and they're looking for fluid relationships, they don't want commitment, they want, they want their emotional and their sexual needs met, but they don't want them in a formal relationship. Exciting. We've had enough, the women of South Weirdos. Korea. As I say, crack what? that word. <laughs> <laughs> what do you make of it, Andy? Maybe people just think it's more hassle than it's worth. Mm. I don't know. I couldn't possibly say. I think people yeah. still want connection. They don't necessarily want long-term commitment. And but, if you're going to live to 120, which the Gen Z generation are going to, can you see yourself with the same person that you meet when you're 20? That's a well, lonely, it's a lonely that life, age. though. If you don't want a soulmate and you don't want children... It's a long time to be yeah, in and out of casual things, isn't it? But change their mind when they're 50. Maybe yeah. that's a bit too late. The, well, exactly. Well, mm. they've done it. I don't know. Do you know. think we might move to a stage where people see a bit like how you used to have one workplace, one career, and now you have sort of two, three careers and five, six workplaces? Maybe, maybe society will change and people will just have... Mm. Three yes, or well, that's all long-term relationships. Yeah, but that, well, don't say that. You'll get married next year. Yeah, no, I'm not talking about myself. I'm delighted yeah, to be getting yeah. married to one person. Forever. It's, yes, I just sort of think it's the situationships. So that people call them. Oh, do they? Oh. Yeah. But the divorce rate is is maintained at the same level that it always was. About what one, is the rate? Well, it's uh, nearly fifty percent in the Western world, and as a result, more people are having their second relationship when they're about 45, 50, 55, and they've still got forty years with that other person. So you mm -hmm. can have a really durable relationship in your later years. 
Very fluid. Oh, I don't know what to make of it all. No, I don't, I don't know either. Let us know what you think. GBnews.com slash your say. Uh, Andy, putting tomato sauce on pizza is an American invention, according to food experts. A new book has suggested that actually tomato on pizza was an Italian-American thing, not an Italian thing. Well, what did they put on it instead? Pesto or something? Uh, so it was uh, a piece of plain focaccia topped with various ingredients but not a tomato sauce. Oh, it's been upgraded then. It has. But, I mean, I mean, I have to say, I... So, perhaps controversially, I just think pizza's rubbish. <gasps> Andy! I do! It's I the go-to! That's because no. you don't like it's cheese, it's gonna though. I just... I don't like cheese. And therefore, <laughs> pizza is just, for me, is a vehicle for <laughs> cheese, which is cool. the worst food. A waste of oh. time. Oh, I had a pizza last night. Did, Did you? you? End of our little holiday, so, yeah, Did pizza last night. Yeah. <gasps> How do you feel this morning? Fabulous. Do you? <laughs> Does it not make you feel really thirsty? Oh, yeah, but it's worth it. Oh, love Andy, it. I've never heard someone say they don't love pizza. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. I've got yeah, no time for that here. No, very upsetting. So we're going to talk about car Cancel. insurance instead. <laughs> yeah, so let's talk about something really interesting. People are not taking out car insurance because they can't afford it. So mm. expensive, Lisa. It's so expensive. You've and, got to have it legally. And that's the problem. There are so many people who live in areas where the transport links are really rubbish, so they need their car. You know, if you're a community nurse, if you work in any kind of industry where you're moving around, you don't necessarily just go to one workplace, but you have to move around, you might need your car, but you can't afford it. Mm. And people are not making claims on yeah. their insurance. Because, first of all, they'll lose their no claims burden. I mean, my, my insurance That's last summer tripled. Yeah, just mine's, tripled. Mine's and tripled. my car is worth less than my insurance. Have you rung them up? Yeah, I, I've changed. Yeah, I oh. mean, I definitely went to one of those web yeah. comparison sites and, and oh, yeah. got a better deal. Always ring them up and they'll drop it by 50%. <laughs> they just do. And we're out of time. Andy, Lucy, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Here's your weather. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello, good morning. Welcome to the latest forecast from the Met Office for GB News. A chilly start in many places today, cloudier in the north with some outbreaks of rain moving in this morning, especially for northern and western Scotland. But a few light outbreaks of rain reaching Northern Ireland later in the morning and then this area pushes into Northern England and eventually North Wales by the middle of the afternoon. Turning cloudier in many places then, but staying sunny in the East Midlands, East Anglia, Southern England as well, where it will feel pleasantly warm, 15, perhaps 16 Celsius. Not feeling pleasantly warm in the northwest with the wind and the rain. And that rain tends to topple its way southwards during the evening, but it also tends to fizzle away, so not a great deal of rain reaching the south or parts of Wales even. And it will be followed by showers, blustery showers, as the wind picks up overnight. With the breeze overnight, temperatures will stay up in the mid to high single figures, so generally frost free, but it's going to be a blustery start to Friday. Areas of cloud moving south, some light showers for many places. The most frequent showers will be affecting the far north of Scotland. The wind will be feeling cold with that wind strongest along the North Sea coast and there'll be some big waves along the North Sea coast as well. Showers by the afternoon confined to the east of England. Elsewhere, brighter spells emerging, some sunshine and highs of 14 or 15 degrees. A brighter outlook with Box Solar. Sponsors of weather on GB News. latest GB News travel. The M65 in Lancashire is partly blocked eastbound by an accident between junctions 2 and 3 west of Blackburn, causing delays. On the M56 in Cheshire, the inside lanes closed eastbound for emergency repairs from junctions 14 and 12 towards Runcorn. After a lorry caught fire yesterday evening, causing queues. The A48M in Cardiff, the outside lanes closed southbound for repairs at St Melons after an accident yesterday, that also causing queues. In Somerset, the A361 is closed each way between Dean and Leighton for repairs after an accident yesterday evening. Train service between Andover and Salisbury, diverting by Southampton because of a gas leak near the railway. In Hampshire, Eastern Road in Portsmouth is closed southbound off the A27 because of a burst water main causing queues, and there are delays of up to an hour to DFDS sailings between Dover and Dunkirk after a passenger was taken ill. And that's the latest.
you can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website, gbnews.com. With thanks to Variety Cruises, a family company sailing since 1942, you have the chance to win a £10,000 seven-night small boat cruise for two. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, you'll be able to choose from any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and explore Greece like never before. Plus, you'll also win £10,000 in tax-free cash to make your summer sizzle. And we'll pack you off with these luxury travel gifts. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens. With our team of dedicated journalists across the UK, GB News brings you accurate reporting of the day's topical agenda. When the news breaks, wherever and whenever it's happening, we'll be there. This is GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. If you want your news to be straight talking, this is a nightmare for the Conservatives again. Down to earth. It's not just Nottingham where this is happening, is it? And most importantly, honest. Hard-working, middle-class taxpayers, they'll get their book thrown at them. Then catch me, Martin Daubney, Monday to Friday, 3 to 6 p.m. on GB News, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Good morning, 9 o'clock, Thursday the 18th of April. Today, another scandal hits the Tory party as the MP Mark Menzies loses the whip over claims he misused campaign funds. A huge headache for Rishi Sunak as yet another Conservative MP loses the whip. What does it mean for his electoral chances? Find out more with me very soon. 70 asylum seekers are moved out of an ex-RAF base after major safety risks emerge. Campaigners at former RAF Wethersfield say the government ignored their serious safety concerns and now they're paying the price. I'll have all the details. The Prince of Wales returns to public duties today for the first time since Princess Catherine revealed her cancer diagnosis. Cameron Walker's got the latest. Well, after three and a half weeks of looking after his wife and children, Prince William is visiting a charity which distributes leftover food to communities who need it. More details shortly. Travel carnage continues in Dubai as flash flooding devastates the city. Earlier, we spoke to one British expat. Unfortunately, um, some people are still stuck in their properties. Some people's homes have been flooded. It really has been a, a very scary time for us all here. Law enforcement take down an illegal website used by cyber criminals to defraud thousands of UK victims. Well, this marks an alarming new development where tech-savvy criminals are teaching others how to trick members of the public into handing over sensitive personal details. It's a beautiful start out there for <coughs> many places and there's more sunshine to come this weekend. But before that happens, there is some rain to talk about in the forecast coming up shortly. Morning to you. I'm Stephen Dixon. And I'm Ellie Costello and this is Breakfast on GB News. Loads of you getting in touch on car insurance. We only mentioned it briefly at the end of the papers. It's because it's a disgrace. It is a disgrace. John Sharp says my insurance went up by 116%. Mm. But he did get it cheaper by shopping around. Yeah, see, that didn't work for me. I've just bought, uh, bought new car insurance. It's tripled in price. And my mum did the ringing up for me. She's good at the bathroom. Oh, is she? Um, it didn't work. 
I think they gave us 20 quid off. Oh. Didn't even work this time around. I didn't get... So that's the other thing, you can't really shop around. I didn't get as much off this time. I always ring up and say, no, no, I'm not paying that. But usually that works. Yeah, well, the, 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 I mean... The, I mean, costs have gone up for everything. But it's the fact that people are now saying... Because you've got to have car, it's a legal obligation, mm -hmm. but people are saying they're not making claims. Which maybe is what they want. Well, they can't afford to... Because they can't afford to lose the no claims and it going up next year even more because you've made a claim. Mm -hmm. It just seems a bit of a con like that. Get the insurance, but if you make a claim, then you know in 12 months' time you're going to pay the price. You'll probably pay it all back plus some. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, loads of you getting in touch on drinking as well. We had a debate earlier about... Uh, it was about banning of smoking, actually, wasn't it? For if you're born in, after 2009, you won't ever be smoking. So our question this morning was, should we ban drinking? Should we get tough on drinking laws as well? Uh, Larty says, our young, not all, seem to need to have alcohol to have a good time. It is in the, it is in the psyche a little bit. Um, which you can question and criticise, but shouldn't we really be bringing in more restrictions on it? I don't think so. Some people like a drink. It helps you to unwind a bit. I know some people have problems with drink, mm. but if you, you know, you've got to, we've got to learn how to handle it properly. Mm. Stuart says, I'm a recovering alcoholic. I'm two years sober. It's a massive problem in the UK and needs to be addressed. And there needs to be training for bar and shop workers to know how much to serve somebody. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And Patricia says the worst thing to help drinkers was cheap booze in supermarkets. That should be an off licenses <clears throat> only. Well, that's not a bad idea. Mm. That's not a bad idea. I mean, it still means it's going to cost us all more. You know. But maybe instead of coming down on pubs, you come down on cheap booze in supermarkets. Mm. I don't know. Would well, you come down on anything at all? Let yeah. us know what you think. Oh. Yeah. Tbnews.com. Slash <laughs> say. I was going to say, don't forget that last bit. Don't forget the last bit. All right, let's have a look at politics for you this morning because there's another scandal hitting the Tory party. Uh, one of their MPs, Mark Menzies, has lost the whip over the alleged misuse of campaign funds. It's a complex story, this one. Yeah, it certainly is. Number 10 have launched an investigation into the matter. Menzies is now no longer a member of the Tory party and will sit as an independent MP in the House of Commons. Let's uh, head to Westminster, should we, and our political correspondent. Olivia Utley, morning to you, Olivia. Break this down a little bit for us, because it's all about money and weird late-night phone calls and being held hostage, apparently. Well, exactly. I mean, it's a it's a complex and, frankly, quite bizarre story that we are hearing. Essentially, what's alleged to have happened is Mark Menzies, the Conservative MP, one of Rishi Sunak's trade envoys, has apparently used £14,000 worth of cam Tory campaign funds for his own personal uses. Now, there are various different uh, episodes in which he is accused of uh, embezzling this money, but the, the most interesting one, perhaps, and the one that the Times News who broke the story led with is that he called his former campaign manager at three o'clock in the morning and said that he needed her to transfer him five thousand pounds of campaign money because he was being detained in his flat by bad men who wouldn't release him unless uh, he paid them off the former campaign manager refused to pay up and a bit later in the day mark menzies called his current campaign manager now asking for six thousand five hundred pounds now the details Details aren't quite clear, but what it sounds like happened is that Mark Menzies went on a uh, internet date with a man who took him back to his flat. It might have then Mark Menzies may have then been sick, and someone demanded five thousand pounds for a clean up. There is also questions swirling, of course, as you would expect, uh, about potential blackmail. What's so bad for Rishi Sunak about this, apart from the fact that he's lost his seventh MP now, I think it is, in, in just two years, is that the Conservative Party were informed of these very, very serious allegations three months ago, and yet the story is only just coming to light and Menzies has only just lost the whip. Why was that? I think it's going to leave Rishi Sunak open to allegations that he was too weak to do anything about it. OK. Olivia, for now, thanks very much indeed. Well, the Conservative Party have also issued a statement. They say the Conservative Party is investigating allegations made regarding a Member of Parliament. This process is rightfully confidential. The party takes all allegations seriously and will always investigate any matters put to them. 
Now, the Home Office has been forced to move asylum seekers out of an ex-RAF base in Essex after safety concerns were raised about the site. Well, our reporter Ray Addison is there for us. And, Ray, what was wrong with the site? Well, this is looking like a bit of a PR disaster for the Home Office and the government. Just 10 months ago, this site had been assessed as safe and fit for purpose. Uh, asylum seekers had started to move into it. And now we're hearing that 70 have moved back out again and into those expensive hotels that the government's very keen to uh, stop housing people in due to the, uh, the identification of safety risks, namely radiation and unexploded ordnance. Now, this is one of the Home Office's uh, largest accommodation sites for asylum seekers. It can house a max of 800 people. Originally, the plan was 1,700, but locals objected to that and they uh, changed their mind and capped it at 800. We don't know how many people are actually in here because the Home Office uh, say it's not their policy to provide that kind of information, uh, but a maximum of 800. Now, last month, they got planning permission to use it for a further three years. That was through something called a special development order that circumvented the permissions from the local council. And there were uh, concerns raised in that SDO about the risk of contamination. And it would appear that those risks have now been realised. As I said, there's um, up to 800 residents behind me. They're going about their daily business today. They are allowed to come and go freely. Um, I grabbed a quick word with two as they went down the road. You have a quick chat? No? Are you guys worried about the contamination on the site? Where are you off to? Where are you going? Oh, where, what, what job do you have? Now, one of the things I thought was interesting about that uh, short uh, exchange I had there with those two gentlemen was when I asked where they were going, one of them appeared to say that they were heading off to work. And, of course, asylum seekers who are waiting to have their uh, claims processed are not allowed to work. Um, we're aware of that. Now, um, Braintree Dr District Council have said that they've written to the Home Office requesting urgent copies of all the relevant technical documents and plans for the SDO. Their uh, key um, emphasis, they say, safeguarding not just the residents inside this base here, but also those in the local community too. Ray Addison, thank you very much indeed. Now, dozens of suspected cyber fraudsters have been arrested across the UK after authorities brought down an illegal website used by thousands of criminals to defraud victims worldwide. Well, police have identified at least 70,000 victims in the UK alone as sophisticated online enablers train criminals to set up fake websites to scam victims into handing over their personal details. Let's talk to our Home and Security editor, Mark White, who's been covering all of this. I mean, clearly a sophisticated setup here, Mark. How big an op of an operation would it have been to, to shut this down? Oh, it was a huge operation. The law enforcement authorities had been infiltrating this particular website uh, for almost a couple of years now, gathering enough in the way of information to be able to move, to bring that site down and to arrest close to 40 suspects in the UK and abroad. Uh, it is a very alarming departure, though, in terms of what is happening in cyber fraud, because what you've got effectively are tech-savvy criminals uh, passing on that knowledge to those people who would want to commit fraud but perhaps don't have the sort of uh, technological know-how to be able to set up these fake sites to scam people for information. And this uh, is called Lab Host, the site, uh, did just that. These criminals would pay a subscription of around two, three hundred pounds um, and for that, they would get a step-by-step -step instruction uh, and fake websites supplied to them. Uh, so step-by-step -step instructions about how to set up 
these websites. And the aim of this was all around phishing. This is, of course, the task of uh, trying to convince people that you are a legitimate bank or retailer uh, and you need the customer's details for whatever reason. And of course, it does work. It uh, people fall for this kind of scam all the time and hand over sensitive details that can be then used to commit fraud um, against you. And there are, it's estimated, at least 70,000 victims in the UK alone, many thousands more around the world, and 490-odd uh, thousand um, uh, sort of banking details uh, have been sort of harvested by these criminals. So a very worrying development. And sadly, although this lab uh, site has now been interrupted and taken down, there are many other such sites now uh, springing up. Yeah, it certainly is very alarming, Mark. Uh, we also understand you've got some breaking news out of Germany this morning. Yeah, details just coming through on this. Uh, a very worrying development out of Bavaria in southern Germany with reports that two German-Russian nationals have been arrested by German federal police accused of plotting to attack military installations uh, in Germany with a view to undermining support for the war in Ukraine. Uh, these two men were arrested uh, today by federal police. Uh, they had been monitoring their activities, according to German federal police. One of the men had been meeting regularly since October of last year uh, with an individual who police have identified as being connected to the Russian Secret Service. And uh, they had discussed a number of plots, including bomb and firebomb attacks, at US bases and also at a base that has been teaching uh, Ukrainian service personnel how to operate tanks that Germany is supplying. Germany has now become uh, the second largest supplier of weapons uh, to Ukraine uh, in recent months. So a very worrying development. More details coming in the uh, minutes and hours ahead. OK, Mark, for now, thanks very much indeed. Well, Britain's newsroom is coming up at 9.30 this morning. Andrew Pearce and Carol Malone are here to tell us all about it. Morning, you morning, two. Morning, How are you? Yeah, yeah good. Right. How are you? Good. Very well. What's so, coming up in the programme? We are talking about what's going on in Scotland with our kids. It's crazy. Shocking story in the front of the Telegraph today. It's just shocking. This is, this is a, it's a group called the LGBT Youth Group of Scotland. And they had a million quid last year from the Scottish Government. And they're talking to kids as young as four and asking them if they're gay... <laughs> trans or lesbian. I mean, how do they know at four? This is just insidious. This, this is hot on the heels of a cast report who warned caution you know, with, with young kids and regender, and yet here they are going ahead. And, and so they're going to have a trans champion, an yes. LGBT champion at the age of four. Unbelievable. I was into Jack and Jill and Humpty Dumpty when me I was too. four. Me too, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. more yeah. Jill, no, no, no. I should think. Stop it. <laughs> we're, also, we're also talking to a trans <laughs> marathon runner yeah. who's run as a man, a woman, no, you, I mean, <laughs> and non-binary. <laughs> and he's going, what does that mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, and of course, this is all on the back of the culture secretary this week, Lucy Fraser, saying this, is all, this nonsense has to stop. You have to run one or either. Yeah. Well, yeah, well, yes. Men, men who transition to 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 whip to females, they cannot enter a race against a woman because they've got an unfair advantage. Well, some some sports bodies already have said yeah. that that's the thing, but there are others who haven't. Football, darts, they haven't. I'm also looking at the fallout from Rwanda, the House of yeah. Lords. Yeah. How many more times are they going to delay this legislation? Mm. Mm. As many as it takes. I yeah, <laughs> just, mm. exactly. Well, it'll, 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 it will go next week, but I mean, it's supposed to be emergency legislation. That's what the Prime how Minister said in November. But how it's can, now April. How can a go for still knocking it back? Well, they, in the end, they have to give in because it's the elected will of the Commons has to prevail. Okay. Mm. Has to. Right, you two. We'll see you a little bit later on. Thank, Thank you very, you very much, much indeed. indeed. We need to get you out because we need to tell our lovely viewers and listeners about their chance to win a ten thousand. You can't have it, Andrew. Ten thousand pound Greek cruise, a luxury travel bundle, and a whopping ten thousand pounds in tax-free cash. Yes, it's our biggest prize of the year so far, and here's how it could all be yours.
With thanks to Variety Cruises, a family company sailing since 1942, you have the chance to win a £10,000 seven-night small boat cruise for two. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, you'll be able to choose from any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and explore Greece like never before. Plus, you'll also win £10,000 in tax-free cash to make your summer sizzle. And we'll pack you off with these luxury travel gifts. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text WIN to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash WIN. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria Di Piero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister. And we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Martin Daubney, weekdays from 3 p.m. This new hate crime bill on women's issues, you think this is the least funny April Fool's joke in history? Yeah, although the Scottish government and the Scottish police do seem to be trying to make a bit of a joke of it when, you know, their campaign Hate Hurts is fronted by a hate monster who's a sort of cuddly, bright red, uh, Muppet style thing. And some of the things that Hamza Youssef said about it were from a, a soft play centre over the weekend. But yeah, it's really not a joke. It's not actually clever lawyers who know the wording of the law who enforce the law. It's the police. And the police have basically not been trained on this at all. There's a two hour online training course they're meant to have done and lots of them haven't already done it. And we know from the way that the police have been talking about it that they're wildly overstretching what it might actually be to be in particular abusive, which is one of the words in the new law, and specifically on the issue of transgender identity to claim that just noticing the fact that there are two sexes and that sex can't change is meant to be hateful. That you know, Even after years of trying to study it, I can't understand why people hold this belief. But it's part and parcel of a pattern of legal measures that the Scottish government has either introduced or has sought to introduce. So it tried to introduce gender self-ID, but that was overruled by Westminster because it was out of the power of the devolved government. It's still attempting to bring in a conversion therapy law, which sounds nice but isn't nice. It actually criminalises proper ethical treatment of gender-confused youngsters. Uh, they're trying to say that uh, men who have certificates saying that their women count as women for a particular measure to do with public boards. And then this uh, hate crime law, which tries to make it really difficult for someone to talk in a factual, reality-based, clear, understandable way about all these measures. It all adds up to a sort of an authoritarian attempt to deny the fact that human beings are mammals and come in two sexes, and that recognising that matters for women's rights especially. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Nine twenty one. Now, Prince William returns to official public duties today for the first time since Catherine revealed her cancer diagnosis. Yes, he's set to visit a surplus food distribution charity, followed by a youth centre in London, which benefits from the organisation's deliveries. All right, let's talk to our role correspondent, Cameron Walker. It is, I have to say, I don't know why, but it's going to be lovely to see him 
out and about and, and sort of getting back to it, in a way. It will, yeah. We had a brief appearance from him and his older son, Prince George, at the football match, the Aston Villa football match, last week. But this will be the first time he's back on public duties post the Princess of Wales disclosing her cancer diagnosis. Uh, it's been a very difficult time for him, but he's very much keeping calm and carrying on. So he's visiting a food surplus distribution charity called Surplus to Supper in Surrey. Uh, and they uh, kind of distribute 10 tonnes of food per week to communities who need it. So churches, food banks, care homes and, and the like. And he's going to be volunteering there, um, packaging up all the food, and then he's going to be delivering it to a youth centre in uh, West London. Kensington Palace says that this is one of his priorities, reducing food waste and the environment, taking a leaf out of his father's book, I might add, who launched the Coronation Food Project in November, doing something very, very similar. But of course, this kind of all adds into Prince William's overall aims with the Earthshot Prize, uh, his environmental prize, trying to repair the planet over the next decade. One of those categories is build a waste-free world. So it all kind of ties in today. Mm. Mm, it certainly does. Um, can I talk to you about this Prince Harry story? That's, yeah. Um, over quite a few of the front pages this morning. Uh, Harry officially registering mm. America as his official home. Yes, I've got the company's house document here oh. in my hands that proves it. It's Prince Henry Charles Albert David, Duke of Sussex, has officially changed his country of residence to the United States. Well, the change actually happened, though, last year, but it's just it was published officially yesterday. I mean, look, it's yeah. front page of the mail this morning. Um, and the sun, yeah. Oh, and the sun, yeah. Yeah. Um, if he'd put country of residence United Kingdom mm -hmm. when he's never here, we'd have something to moan about, wouldn't we? I think so. I think he's probably damned if he does, damned if he doesn't. Mm -hmm. To be honest, this appears to be a bit of a formality. This is the company's house documents for Travelist, which is the company he set up kind of to make eco-travel a possibility, supporting local communities around the world. Uh, so that's the company he set, set up for that. Uh, again, I think because it's just a formality, I feel like perhaps we've, we may be making, making a bit of a mountain out of a molehill here. Uh, but it does show a very clear um, cut of ties from the United Kingdom because it's now in black and white that Prince Harry resides in the United States mm. and appears to suggest that he's not going to be returning to Britain anytime soon, which was the original plan perhaps in 2020, split the time between the two countries. Do you think it means anything for the distance between the family and family relations? Look, Prince Harry uh, maintains he loves his family. Of course, he flew over to the, to the United Kingdom following King Charles's cancer diagnosis for a very short amount of time. But there clearly is still a bit of a rift. We mm. understand that Prince William and Harry have not been on speaking terms for some time. Any time you mention Prince Harry to sources close to Prince William, your a barrier goes up. They do not want to talk about Prince Harry. And I don't see a way out of it, to be honest, at this stage. I think Prince Harry, we're going to see at the Invictus Games next month here in the United Kingdom, the service marking 10 years uh, since those games that he set up. Will other members of the royal family support him in that? We'll have to wait and see. Mm. OK. Cameron, thank you very much indeed. Good to see you. Yeah, good to see you. Uh, that's it from us today. We're back tomorrow from 6am. And Britain's Newsroom is up next with Andrew and Carol. A brighter outlook with Box Solar. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello, good morning. Welcome to the latest forecast from the Met Office for GB News. A chilly start in many places today, cloudier in the north with some outbreaks of rain moving in this morning, especially for northern and western Scotland. But a few light outbreaks of rain reaching Northern Ireland later in the morning. And then this area pushes into Northern England and eventually North Wales by the middle of the afternoon. Turning cloudier in many places.